in faculty parks, Mohammad Zahi said, can you come to that? Next, I request our chairman, Department of Linguistics, Professor A.R. Fakhi, to can come to the dining Next, I invite Professor India Sassan, local coordinator, post program. Now, I invite Mohammad Yangi, who is the local coordinator, Yang AMU. I request our Dean Professor Muhammad Zahi Sam to kindly preside over this conference. Keeping up with the tradition of Aligarh Muslim University, we begin our program with a recitation from the Holy Quran. So I request Muhammad Khalid Sam to kindly come to the and recite words from the Holy أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الإنسان ما غرك بربك الكريم الذي خلقك فسوى Professor Panchalan Mohanty is 
from Center of Applied Linguistics and Translation Studies, University of Hyderabad. He is also Director, Center for Endangered Languages and Mother Tongue Studies, Hyderabad. He has published several books and papers in international and national journals. So I we welcome you all. Now I call our student, Watmish Mosin, kindly present day to mentor to our guest, Professor Nicola Sauce. <laughs> our extra scholars, Joel, kindly come and present a mentor to the Dean, Faculty of Arts. <laughs> now I invite the local Gyan Local Coordinator, Alira Muslim University, Dr. Muhammad Jahangir Warsi, to introduce the Gyan program. Honorable Chief Guest, Professor Nicholas Ostler. Our Dean, Faculty of Arts, Professor Jaisa, Chairman, Department of Linguistics, Professor Yaar Pakesa, uh, Professor Kanchan and Mohanty from University of Hyderabad, uh, India Sir, uh, Professor Saab Fadal Sir, Talipur Islam Sir, uh, on, all my colleagues and their students, a very good morning and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. On behalf of the university, on behalf of our vice chancellor, who could not make it for some reason, and on my own personal behalf, I welcome you all in this sunny and beautiful campus. I have heard that some of you have trouble getting a room, nice room. It, was, it has happened due to like Professor Imtiaz Hasnain was out of country. I was out of town. But uh, I am sure you may have made it to a nicer room and uh, I assure you in the coming days you will not have those kind of problems. So once again I welcome you all in this campus. As the university coordinator for this Gyan program, I have a duty to perform and uh, so say a few words about this. I, I was teaching at UC Berkeley when Professor Ernie was invited to say a few words. He said a linguist cannot be a linguist if he cannot say a few words. So I am here to say a few words. Global Initiative of Academic Network, which is also known as GYAN, in higher education is a promising scheme of the government of India through the Ministry of Human Resource Development. GYAN aims at the tapping the talent pool of scientists, experts, entrepreneurs to engage with the Institute of Higher Education in India to augment the country's existing academic resources, accelerate the pace of the quality reforms, and further strengthen India's scientific and technological capabilities. This program was initially conceptualized as an Indo-US collaboration, but was later its scope was extended in order to garner the best international experience into our system of education enable the interaction of students and faculty with the best academic and industry experts from all around the world and also share their experiences and expertise to motivate people to work on Indian programs which has happened during the retreat of IITs with the Minister of Human Resource Development Government of India on 29th June 2014 at Goa. It was decided that a system of guest lectures by internationally and nationally renowned experts would be evolved along with the comprehensive faculty development program, not only for the new IITs, IIMs, IISERs, but also to other institutions like central universities in the country. The scheme connects India's top institutions and central universities with global faculty. It will be helpful for adoption of new methods in teaching, boosting research and cutting edge technologies and building a stronger academic network. For this purpose, IIT Harapur is the northern institution 
and national coordinator of the GYAN program. There are few objectives for which this GYAN was initiated, which includes to increase the footfalls of recruited international faculty in Indian academic institutes, provide opportunity to our faculty to learn and share knowledge and teaching skills in cutting edge areas, to provide opportunity to our students to seek knowledge and experience from recruited international faculty, to create avenues for possible collaborative research with the international faculty, to increase participation and presence of international students in the academic institute, opportunity for the students of different institutes, universities to interact, to learn subject in core areas through the collaborative learning process, provide opportunity for the technical persons from Indian industry to improve understanding and update their knowledge in relevant areas, motivate the best international experts in the world to work on problems related to India, develop high quality course materials in core areas both through video and print that can be used by the larger body of the students and teachers, and to document and develop new pedagogic methods in emerging topics of national and international interest. Keeping the importance of this scheme and to further enrich the university's scientific, technological and research capabilities, Aligarh Muslim University has taken keen interest in hosting the GYAN program. So far, 16 proposals have been submitted uh, to the GYAN by our faculty members. To run the GYAN program smoothly and to get the maximum proposal submitted by our faculty, the Honorable Vice Chancellor Professor Tariq Mansoor has allotted a separate office to make this transition more smooth to maximize the number of proposals, which I urge and request all the faculty members who are present here. In the next cycle, you will be getting an email or a letter from me to submit the proposal so that we can have a larger participation in the GYAN scheme, which is very prestigious and every big institution are taking advantage of that. So I urge you, I request you all to apply, which I feel it is going to open in January, the next cycle to submit the proposals. So with these few words, I would like to once again welcome you. I welcome all the guests sitting here on the dais. I welcome you all for coming all across the country. So welcome you all and I hope these four and five days will be much more fruitful for all of us to get enriched and acknowledge each other for their academic excellence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. For introducing the Gyan Initiative, initiated by the Ministry of Human Resources and Development in the Government of India. Now I invite Professor S. M. Kias Kasnin, the course coordinator, to introduce the Good morning to all of you. Professor Mohammad Zahid, the Dean Faculty of Arts, our distinguished keynote key speaker for the entire course, Professor Nicholas Osler. I'm sure you all are familiar with Nicholas Osler, a person who has a name in the field of language endangerment. And we are extremely grateful that a person of that stature is there today with us. Professor Mohanty, who interestingly, there's the only center in India, independent center, before the UGC launched opening courses and centers on the endangered languages in different center universities. <laughs> Prior to that, Professor Mohanty has been heading a center for endangered languages and mother tongue studies at University of Hyderabad. It's our honor to have him here. My distinguished chairman, my colleague, Professor Jahangir Varsi, my colleague, Mr. Masood Ali Bey, and I'm really happy that my colleagues from across the department who have come here, Professor Vaseem Ahmad, Professor Tariq Mansoor, Professor Fazal Shah, and a number of colleagues, and we have our very dynamic library Mr. Dr. Nabi Hassan, who is here. My distinguished colleagues from other departments and my participants. I stand here today to tell you about the GAN course, which as the GAN coordinator has just talked about, there is a very prestigious program. It's our honor to have this program being launched by the Aligarh Muslim University 
and that to the Department of Linguistics. And of course, it's an honor for all of you that you could come here, despite all odds that you could face, both in terms of accommodation and in terms of traveling all the way from different places across the country. I thought that to begin our outline of the course, the best quote could be nothing but a quote from Bruch. And I quote her, just as the information age has commenced, two of the world's great shares, stores of information, the diversity of biological organisms and of human languages are imperative. We are talking about in languages in danger. In the age of globalized world and open market, more of the human issues like the issue of language endangerment, language loss, and language extinction got pushed further to the margins, which already were on the periphery. Cultural invasion leading to loss of language and cultural heritage, which may be Narmada for us, or destruction of forests in Malaysia, has now attracted attention of several individuals and community of the speakers of endangered languages. A documentary film, The Linguist, featuring David Harrison and Gregory Anderson, premiered at the Sundance Film Festival, alludes to the interest raised regarding extinction, loss, and endangerment. The linguists made headlines around the world and generated immense publicity to raise public awareness about endangered and disappearing languages and the consequent threat to linguistic diversity. Today, both individuals and speakers of the endangered languages have become conscious of and sensitive to the issues of language endangerment. Several organizations are working with threatened or endangered languages. And some of those <coughs> departments and institutions which are working, I've just named about the Center for Endangered Languages at Hyderabad. We have the CIL, the Nodal Center of the Government of India, which has a scheme for the protection and preservation of endangered languages. And we have a representative from the CIL, Ms. Dr. Ram, Dr. Parman Singh, who has come all the way from CIL. We have other centers which are working in this direction, besides the center universities which have been allotted to start Center for Endangered Languages in their respective universities. Outside India, we have the chair chairman of the Foundation for Endangered Languages, none other than <laughs> Professor Osler, who is amidst, amidst us. We also have the Endangered Languages Funds Department of Linguistics at Yale University, Living Tongues Institute for Endangered Languages at Oregon, Work Group on Native Languages at University of Köln, Germany, and a permanent international committee of linguists, University of Leiden, and Terra Lingua. There are many, I've just named a few. Language is not merely a cluster of words or a set of grammatical rules, but a flesh of human spirit by which the soul of culture reaches into material worlds. This is a quotation from Davis that appeared in Wine's article. In fact, each language is unique in a deep sense. It is the repository of accumulated thoughts and experiences of people. Their metaphors and specialized knowledges, their unique experiences that develop over many lifetimes. According to an estimate proposed by Cross, as many as 95% approximately 6,000 languages spoken in the world in this century may become extinct as they are dying out at an alarming pace. Regarding the remaining 5%, Cross says that they will belong to at most 20 language, 20 language families and the two major language families of the world, namely Indo-European and Niger-Congo, will take up more than half of the languages from this 5%. A similar observation has been made by Wines that 100 years later, more than 95% of all languages currently spoken in the world may be dead and that there may be less than 600 different languages in the world. Of course, language, lo language loss, 
language engagement has been perceived by different people in different ways. For us, this perception is very sensitive. We are sensitive to the loss of languages. Because what happens when we lose a language? Of course, when we lose a language, we lose a culture. We, intellectual wealth, a work of art, is dropping a bomb on a museum. Hence, Kenan destruction of the forest in Malaysia represents far more than the loss of subsistence. It implies the death of a people and anthropomorphologically speaking, the death of language. It also brings with it a sort of collective amnesia whereby generations of Penan have forgotten that the use of the word tank which is fairly common to all of us, thank you, is alien to their culture. For sharing in their culture is an obligation that have six words for we. We have only one word for we. They have six words for we and only one word for he, she and it. Which underlines the solidarity and shared feeling among the people. They have further, further forgotten that there existed over 2,000 names for streams alone, each imbued with its own history, representing the cultural significance of the land. In fact, a generation of Andamanese, which has been brought out by the significant work by Professor Anita Abhi, it has been discovered that Andamanese today, the generation today which is there, it has forgotten that there existed in their repertoire a word called Rapuch, which is a word which means the one who loses one's siblings. We do not have a word where we are concerned about the loss of our siblings even. That is the, that is the thing, that is the extent to which the languages are disappearing and along with the languages, the culture is disappearing and the amnesia is setting in which we have forgotten what has been the past. When you lose a language, you lose your culture. Or if we go by an estimate given by some anthropologists, roughly around 300 million people all over the world carry their identity as members of an indigenous culture, which is strong and deeply rooted in history and language, and tied down to myth and memory of a particular place. As Vines claims, each language is unique in a deep sense. Where would we without the where we where would we be without the traditional wisdom found in oral history, poetry, epic tales, creation stories, jokes, riddles, wise sayings, and lullabies, which are the product of human languages, but have never been written down? This is the ethical dimension which makes it necessary to understand the consequences of languages in danger. Today we are here to talk about that. I'm, I'm really sorry to, uh, uh, that we are going to miss our Vice Chancellor who was extremely enthusiastic about this entire theme and he wanted to come but you know as things go in the university things are very uncertain for the people who are heading the university. So suddenly a, a very urgent call has come and he has to stay put in the office. With these words I thank you once again for being here with all of us and we can share a lot from what our key speakers would be giving to us. Along with Professor Kostler, we have Professor Panchanan Mohanty, who will be giving two lectures here. And we have Professor Anvita Abhi, who is scheduled to be here on the 20th of this month. Of course, after two days. We have Professor Uday Narayan Singh, he is coming on the 21st. And we'll have a practical demonstration of working with Elan, with audacity and even flex on this second last day of the program. And as you know, it's, it's mandatory on the part of the Gyan that every course that is being organized, we must have a feedback from the participants, we must have a feedback from the resource persons. So I would request you all to please be honest enough in your feedback because that will help the Gyan improve itself, its further programs. And towards the end of the day, that is on the 24th, will have your tests based on what has been taught to you. 
I kept it at the last so that you don't have any problems later on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Nusnain, for a very lucid introduction of the theme of this course. Now it's time to hear our changes today. Professor Nicholas Osnil, I invite you to kindly present your remarks.
part of the discourse, so I hope you'll find that interesting. Um, that's how we start, but oh, very soon we will move on to um, activities which will involve you, the audience. I can see there are a large number of microphones here, and I hope they will be used um, in the course of this week. Um, we have a, a first a workshop or tutorial session um, on language documentation, which of course is important for um, the languages which find themselves um, unable to reproduce naturally. And what we, um, we have a problem, it could be said. Um, is it possible I could get a, a glass of water? Um, um, the, um, so, um, it, we have a problem in that there are quite a large number of you, about 50 I think, and it's quite difficult to organize and what one might call a tutorial session with that number. But we have thought of a procedure for perhaps doing that. And I will bring this to your attention now, um, rather than later. Um, in in the, uh, this um, copy document you have, uh, it starts proposed organization of workshop tutorials by Nick and those of us. Um, I talk about um, how we are thinking of organizing this. Um, Effectively, there should be a, a, a tutorial session on documentation tomorrow, and another uh, tutorial session on providing scripts for um, unwritten languages on a, on a subsequent day. I'm trying to work out which day it's going to be on. Workshop number two on December the 20th. So that's the day after tomorrow. And um, we have a distinguished audience. We know we have a distinguished audience. But I don't know uh, which of you are distinguished in different ways. So what I would like is, is, um, is for each of you who finds yourself um, inspired by the, um, the program um, to, cut, to give a note to me um, as to what you might be able to talk about. Just in five minutes. An expertise, a, a matter of, of your, your interest in this field, and, and with any luck, if you look at the, um, the pages, you will find a um, section in which you would naturally fit. So they, there are numbers and letters and so on, um, which will determine how the your section fit together. If I have those notes, and then tomorrow I will be able to call on you at the right moment. Um, to make your contribution. So I do um, urge you um, not to be modest, and in particular, it might be more sensible if you think not so much about what you could talk about as to some aspect of language endangerment or the role of languages in the world which has puzzled you. You can raise a question, and with any luck, there'll be somebody else in the audience who can venture an answer to it. So I do urge you to, to take part in that. Uh, I probably will remind you at the end of the day that we'd like a, um, a note from you. Right, so that's um, a sort of um, bookkeeping, um, shopkeeping item to try and uh, get things organized. Thank you. And this is not many good old, as Pindar said, best is water. Um, let's go back um, to the matter of the introduction. Um, I am, as uh, has been mentioned, um, the chairman of the Foundation for Endangered Languages, um, which organization has been going for just over 20 years now. Um, and we are a charity which uh, exists um, primarily, I suppose, to um, gather funds and distribute them for projects on endangered language endangerment. We are a membership organization, so anyone can join, and regardless of their um, academic distinction. And it happens that at the moment, we have a call for uh, grants, uh, that's the applications for grants, 
which is open and will be open until the end of this month of December. So if you uh, are in need of some funds for an invented language project, it will be possible for you to uh, join the organization and put in an, uh, an application very quickly for that. So I would urge you to do that. Um, they will, um, there, there is actually a leaflet I have, which I'll, I think will probably make available in the first break, uh, which talks about um, the membership of the Foundation for Indian Languages, and I'll make sure that that's, that's available to you. Anyway, um, in the course of those 20 years that the Foundation for Endangered Languages has been um, attempting to organize um, efforts for endangered languages, um, we've had a conference every year somewhere in the world. And each of those conferences, um, except the first one, unfortunately, um, resulted in a volume being produced and published. And so we now have a set of 20 books which represent um, activities going on and the concern for particular languages all around the world. And I have a whole set here. I, I, I don't know if there's much point in I have a set here. I want it to be available to people in the break to see what it is like. And then, of course, I shall leave this, at least one set of these books for um, the university here um, at the end of the course. Um, you may be inspired, perhaps, to order copies of it yourself if you um, find something interesting in there. But if anyway, it would be useful to you as scholars in the field of endangered languages to know that there is this resource available. Um, so I said that, uh, so in, in that sense, that, that, that's a rather major uh, contribution, uh, at least in terms of, of books about endangered languages. My own um, personal um, activities as an author um, have tended to be talking more about the endangering languages than the um, endangered languages. I mean, I'm very interested really in the process by which uh, languages spread throughout the world, um, what stops them, what, what the effects are of those spread. And that has come about in, in the um, the four books which I have written for a general audience, really, on languages in the world. Uh, they are, as has been mentioned, uh, a, a language history of the world as a whole, it's called Empires of the World, it came out um, 12 years ago, on the Empires of the World. Another book which is a um, biography of Latin um, called Ad Infinitum. A third book, which was about really specifically about languages which um, are, in a, way, in a sense, everywhere and nowhere. Um, there was a notorious um, remark made by our Prime Minister just a, um, a few months ago, saying that if you consider yourself to be a citizen of the world, you are a citizen of nowhere. And this is what, one of the grounds, apparently, in my is a good idea for the Europe. European Union to no longer have the United Kingdom as a member. Um, well, but whatever there may be the case on that, um, it is the case that um, uh, English has played a very large um, role in unifying world's communications uh, over the past uh, 150 years. Um, but that's the, only the most recent language to do that. And in this book, I talk about other languages which have played that role in the past. Um, not just um, in, uh, in Europe, but um, have devoted considerable space to Persian and its, its roles in, in, in Western Asia over many centuries, and indeed Pali. So um, I, I, I try to see what uh, is often seen as a sort of European or Western um, concept of languages, to put it into a wider context of the world's languages as a whole. And um, perhaps to sort of bring the circle round again, uh, well, I have one other book which um, is about the effect of <coughs> languages on world religions. I mean, people who embrace a religion usually want to believe that it, it embodies the truth and it's been there always. 
And it may be um, an, an eternal truth, but it may also be an evolving truth. And the fact is that for a, language, for a religion to spread around the world, it needs to reinvent itself in, in new languages, because languages are more widespread than, and at least at the beginning, than, a, than any given faith. And so there's that, it's quite interesting to look at the history of faiths as they spread through different language areas and consider what the effects of languages on faiths have been. Um, I won't be talking very much about that in, in this, uh, this, uh, this course of the, uh, this week, uh, but it is available in that, in that book, Passwords to Paradise. Um, so, um, let us look at um, the world's languages in a, in a, in a general framework. Um, I picked out um, as the um, epigraph to one of the chapters of Ad Infinitum, my book on Latin, a, a, a Latin verse which asks the main questions. Quis quidubi quibus auxiliis cur formulo quando? Now that happens to be an hexameter line in Latin, which is the most uh, notable um, verse form in Latin, in much the same way that the shlok is in Sanskrit. It's, you know, quis, who, quid, what, ubi, where, quibus auxiliis, by what means, cur, why, homono, how, quando, when. And this is a way of, of, of organizing a organizing a, um, a research product um, in Latin. It's, it occurred to me that one could actually produce um, an Anushtuf um, shlok in Sanskrit for doing much the same thing. Kim kasma kimartam And if you look at that, then you can see that those different questions uh, that was a bit of Sanskrit was too much of the technical. <laughs> All right. um, and as you can see, the te then, uh, if, you, if, you, if you're following along in the uh, uh, copy documents, uh, you can see that um, writing Devanagari was too much for whatever um, Western-oriented uh, word processing um, device um, produced this, these pieces of paper. So that I had actually written it down in... Uh, uh, Devanagari more naturally for Sanskrit than Roman, but only the Roman has got through, and there's a sort of moral there somewhere. Um, anyway, if one thinks about that, one can then organize many of the, uh, the, the talks that we've had um, over the years. Um, so, Kach would uh, uh, focus on the speaking community of a language and its history. Kim the language itself, as it is documented. Kutra, its location and its geography. Kina, um, by what, um, what, by useful, so that can also mean useful collaborations, but it means with what, and also tools, um, using what. Kasmat, where does it come from? Kimartam, what is the value that it has to its community? Katam, how should we go about revitalizing it? And Kadara, how in practice can we schedule this? When is going to happen? And if you look then, then you can see that uh, I, I, I've got a page um, afterwards which gives you the titles of the FEL volumes um, over the past 21 years. And um, I've assigned them really uh, to those different sections. Um, a, a different way and uh, a new way of integrating and organizing um, what we've said over the past 20 years, it becomes a bit overwhelming when you've got so many individual titles. And but each one of those volumes contains about um, 20 to 30 um, articles about usually individual um, languages. So we've got something like 500 to 600 articles in this library which we've built up over 20 years. Now, having said so much really for the background um, of why I'm here and what I'm 
what I'm doing. I think we need to move on to the content of the first lecture. Are we going to be able to get a PowerPoint? So, so, oh, so the, this, okay, so is that, perhaps that's the end of my contribution? Yes, that's good. Uh, that's a useful clarification. I think we should move on. Um, so, right, so we'll, when we get on to the next lecture, you will um, no doubt enjoy it. Things will suddenly be in colour. Good. Now I invite our guest, Professor Panchanan Mohanty from the University of Hyderabad to say a few words. Today's Hindi is nothing but khadi boli. It's a boli also. 
Now, such things must be, and English doesn't have its own script, and English man is sitting here. It has borrowed the script from Latin. And Hindi doesn't uh, have its own script. Urdu doesn't have its own script. I mean, why are you so much emphatic about scripts writing? Why don't you emphasize the languages? Then comes script. Script is important. I don't say, say that script is not important, but first emphasize languages. Then only script. Um, um, Professor um, uh, Hasnain referred to amnesia. This country has uh, had a complete break in 19th century. That's the greatest amnesia we have uh, uh, experienced in this country ever. I'll give you an example. Uh, most literary teachers uh, you know that if you are reading ancient or medieval literature, especially if you are teaching poetry, poems, you'll see that every poem has a raga and a tala. Every poem. I am yet to see a teacher of Indian languages who knows the ragas and talas. What are you teaching? You are teaching something like, you know, you teach prose. You recite and give the meanings but never the Raga and Tala, which are linked to the semantic import, the content of the poem. So, that is, the, we'll have to probably revamp everything if we are very serious about it. Professor Nicholas Ostler referred to uh, endangering languages. I have heard him many times. And he um, also, which he didn't uh, do, a metaphor, big fish and small fish. And he has done that. Yes, yes, he has done that. And he said, you know, he believes that big fish would eat small fish. Uh, well, I have a little kind of footnote to whatever he is saying. In the ocean, there are many big fishes and many small fishes. They live happily together. Why can we not do the same thing on earth? We could do that also. Look, big, we won't allow the big fish or big fishes to become hooligans, to go, to become goons. And why should a language endanger another small language? Is it not hooliganism? I mean, if we have something called language planning, everybody will be in place. Since we don't have that, some people have become like that. Now, big languages also have many deficiencies, including Sanskrit. I've been very, I know Sanskrit reasonably well. Um, including Sanskrit, I'll give you a very simple example. Not only um, Sanskrit, but also Hindi. Hindi is no less. If you think that Hindi will do a great language, well, my language is also a great language. A small language is also a great language. You know, that, I'll give you one example. Take uh, the word for mouth. In Sanskrit, normally it is mukha. How will you make a distinction between mouth and face? How will you make a distinction between mouth and face in Hindi Urdu? Mudho kyao or tumara mu chik nahi dikha hai. Both face and mouth. If you ask me, I will make distinction. My language makes a distinction between mouth and face. I know so my language means I don't say worry, I do that. But many small languages can do that. I'll give you many such examples to show that small languages also do that. Now that a um, very learned scholar of Latin is sitting, I'll tell you that um, um, there are two words I would like to just mention. One is monster, one is dexter. Monster is left. You interpret it any way you like, and Dexter is right, which is Dexter is of course a, uh, a, a cognate of Dakshina in Sanskrit. Uh, small languages do the same thing. I work on small languages spoken in Odisha and Andhra Pradesh. This is Bhujni Hatha, Bhujni is Bhojan, to eat, eating hand, this is Debri Hatha. I won't have to tell you the meaning of that. We make a distinction. Now, whatever Latin used to do, the small languages also do. Can you do that in Hindi, Urdu, or whatever, Marathi, Bangla, Odia? Can you do that? You cannot. Now, see, 
the world. I mean, we are, what I'm trying to say is that the cognitive abilities of the small language speakers is quite important, significant, and the languages are very important. As it has been already mentioned, every language has importance, and that we must recognize. Um, well, somebody, please don't make a distinction between language and dialect. Yes, it is there. Linguistically, yes, something can be done. But nothing is fixed. Yesterday, Maithili was a language of Hindi. Today, it's a separate language. Uh, yesterday, uh, Konkani was a dialect of Marathi. It's a separate language. So, all these things are happening. So, that's not important. Now, we must, um, I am trying to impress upon the younger people present here that if somebody says that, yeah, Teri Bhasha to Boli hai, I think this is nothing but linguistic untouchability. And this is something which I feel very seriously. I'm serious about uh, all these things. Why not you respect my language? Also, it's mother tongue is like my mother. I would always link like that. Mother tongue is like mother. And even in fact, I strongly believe in that. Maybe when I do in my lecture, I'll mention all those things. Now, if not, let's talk about linguistic untouchability also. And let's try uh, to celebrate uh, uh, linguistic diversity, small languages, big languages, everybody is important. As you kill a small animal, you will be punished. It doesn't matter. You are going to be punished. And uh, this is what is happening. So if anybody is not looking after small language uh, in this country, there should be some kind of provision for that. And thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mahmoudi, for triggering our sensibilities towards language diversities. Now, we invite our Dean Faculty of Arts, Professor Mohammad Zahid, Saab, to present the presentation.
the foundation for endangered languages, a registered body that supports, enables, and assists the documentation, protection, and promotion of endangered languages. She is the author of a number of books, including Empires of the World, A Language History of the World, and An Infinitum, a biography of Latin in most of his writings. Professor Nicholas Ostler has explored what humanity stands to lose as a result of language loss. Language diversity is essential to the human heritage. Each and every language embodies the unique cultural wisdom of a people. The loss of any language is thus a loss of all humanity. He has addressed you on a topic which is very much close to his heart. I also welcome Professor Panjanan Mohanty. Professor Mohanty is a professor at the Center of Applied Linguistic and Translation. He studies at the University of Hyderabad. He teaches various subjects in linguistics and applied linguistics. I have published more than 100 papers in journals like General Linguistics, Language Policy, <coughs> Language Problems, and Language Planning. Journal of Professional and Academic English Mother Tongue, Indian Linguistics. International Journal of Davidian Linguistic. Welcome to Aligarh, sir. I wish to take this opportunity to welcome Padmavadi Professor Abita Abdi. She is likely to join us later. She is known <coughs> for his studies on tribal languages and other minority languages of South Asia. Her studies have helped in identifying the distinct characteristics of two great and the Mami's <coughs> language, Jarawa and Onj. She has more than a dozen books to her credit. Professor Abdi has held many positions of importance, both at administrative and academic level. At present, she is the director, Center of Oral and Tribal Literature Sahit Academy. I wish to take this opportunity to welcome the participants from Maharashtra, Bihar, Delhi, Uttar Pradesh, West Bengal, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Andhra Pradesh, who have arrived here to join this series. We are delighted to have you here to participate and share your views in the workshop. Thank you for coming. That many of your Travel long distances serve to remind us all just how important this endeavor is. It is gratifying to note that the agenda of the workshop covers a wide range of very interesting items relating to the language endangerment and especially those directly related to language vitalization and language documentation. A language is a danger which when its speaker ceases to use it, use it 
in a increasing increasingly reduced number of communicative domains and seek to pass it on from one generation to the next that is there are no new speakers adults or children in concluding i wish you very success in your deliberations and very pleasant stay in aligarh thanks
for being part of the course. Your contribution did not go unnoticed. I cannot thank everyone enough for the involvement they have shown. I am thankful to Dr. Nazreen Lashka, who was, who is rather comparing this morning. Dr. Sabahuddin Ahmad, Dr. Abdul Aziz, Dr. Masood Hussain Saab, and the office staff for the willingness they have expressed to take on the completion of the task beyond their comfort zones. Mr. Chairman, sir, and ladies and gentlemen, once again I want to state that we are all most grateful to you all. We thank you for being with us this morning. It has been a great pleasure. As we say in Urdu, jab ek zabaan marti hai, to uske saath ek tahzeeb khatm hoti hai. So we all need to join hands to preserve the languages. Thank you very much. <coughs> Now we end the program before that, we present the University Telema followed by the National Anthem.
the presence of humanity in the Americas is much, much more recent than it is in Eurasia. Um, we can trace this, um, this movement. I mean, we, we, the last slide shows the sort of consensus that there is at the moment about the human colonization of the Earth. Um, but there are various forms of um, genetic um, evidence that can be used, which by and large, luckily enough, confirm this, this pattern. Um, one, one way that one can look is on the looking for the pattern of genes um, which are passed on through one line or another, so the female line or the male line. The, main, the, 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 the primary um, genetic group for talking about um, um, feminine um, spread um, genes is mitochondrial DNA, which, you, which both men and women get from their mothers alone. And on the male side, there is um, the Y chromosome, which is only passed from males to males. And you can then look at the, at the pattern of uh, mitochondrial, mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosomes across the populations of the world, as they are now, and, find, and more or less map how the uh, genes have changed through mutation. And this gives you an implicit map of what is related to what. And you get a, a, a map which turns out to be much the same map as the one we've just looked at. Um, what we're looking at here is in the, the male case, a Y chromosome, haplogroups. Haplogroups means that they um, come from just one side of the um, ancestry, namely in this case the male side. And uh, what you can see is, again, um, the um, original area of, 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 um, of the genes will be in Central Africa. And there have been changes as the population gradually moved from there to other places in the world. And, uh, there you can see it. So basically I'm showing you this not to give you an exercise or an, a, a lesson in uh, genetics. Uh, it's, it's fascinating that it is, but I'm qualified as I would be to give that lecture. But anyway, this is just to reassure you that as far as modern science knows, that pattern of, um, of occupation of the world by humanity is uh, reinforced by what we know from genetics. Uh, what we can also do, is, and now we come a bit closer to home as linguists, is look at the way languages are related to each other across the world and see uh, where, what pattern that creates. Uh, there are different ways you can do that. This particular map comes from um, emails, uh, the World Atlas of Language Structures, which you can find on the internet very easily. Um, and in this case, they uh, arranged the languages by topological data, which means how they cope with certain um, aspects of geometry. Um, and so this is not it, 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 what we would at this stage consider to be genetic linguistics, but it's, it's a sort of typological similarity map of the world's languages. And once again, we have this thing that, the, that the, there's an, a concentrated area of languages which are all the same, oh, whoops, work all the same. Um, in Africa, and then there are, are different patterns in these different areas, Europe, South Asia, um, another <coughs> concentrated area in Indonesia, and another one more in Australia, and then uh, more uh, variation has been, uh, has been invented, you could say, um, as the languages spread into different parts of North and, and finally South America. So the point is that this, this, this sort of evidence also confirms the, the spread. And then if you look at the um, world as a set of um, language families, which is uh, used in the, uh, built up using the methods of comparative philology, which were developed in the 19th century, uh, particularly in Western Europe, um, 
you see again that there are these families, and the families um, unite the areas which we think um, were old settlements as against new settlements. So, what the, so this is the more uh, specifically um, linguistic genetic evidence summarized on this map, um, showing the um, the relationship of the languages spoken in different parts of the world. Um, so, um, that, that is the, the, how the language is called. This is basically the, the variety, the origin of the variety which we think we want to uh, attempt to preserve um, in the face of modern developments. And there are various things that one can say um, about language, um, which um, give it its role in human society. Uh, one thing that I put early on is a little uh, uh, insight which occurred to me when I was writing Empires of the Word, that if language, this faculty of language, makes us human, it's the fact that languages are different from each other, that the fact that there are languages which make us superhuman, the fact that we can actually organize in a very large Large scale. As I said, we, we achieved this um, spread of humanity around the world without knowing that the world was there or without knowing what the world was to overtake. And certainly, by the time there were human beings all around the world, people at the extremities had no knowledge at all of their ancestors and cousins in other parts of the world, although they were there. Um, so the, the languages, you see, therefore, are, have. In the course of um, spreading around the world, and perhaps we started with a single language there coming out of Africa, um, but um, when we lost touch with each other, we started um, um, developing our languages in different directions. Um, and the result was that instead of having just a faculty of language, we had a whole set of different language faculties. Um, so, where are, and, and this, in a way, um, has given humanity uh, much of its ability to survive all the way around the world. Um, languages make us superhuman by giving us joint goals and imperatives, and even uh, with, with the advent of, of empires, enforcing the goals and imperatives on our people. We assume, uh, in, perhaps in an Arcadian way, that when humanity was spreading around the world, they were in small groups of hunter-gatherers who were largely unable to, to control each other. They just went off and did their own thing. And they might have problems from their environment or from um, wild beasts and so on. But they were not in a position to actually make each other do things. But later on, you can see, and uh, we'll talk about it in a moment, with the uh, advent of farming, a large-scale organization in a single place, you, start, you get the advent of armies and empires and people making each other do what they don't want to do. Um, anyway, because we've got these, these languages, however, as well as having joint goals and parents, we're also aware of ourselves as being a group. We, we come across people who speak a different language and we can't communicate with them and say, well, they're different from us. And so languages tend to organize human, um, human groups even beyond um, people's knowing about it, they become <coughs> batches of group identity. And little by little, because languages always have traditions, and uh, because the young ones learn it from the older ones, you get traditions <coughs> of history growing up. And people have their own ideas of where they come from. Another thing is, though, that um, there's a sort of generalized um, um, property of um, human societies, um, which in the discipline of economics, you may have heard one of my um, degrees is supposed to be in economics, and I spent at least two years um, thinking about um, the world from an economic perspective. And one of the most important things in economics is the pattern of falling marginal costs. So the bigger a unit gets, the less it costs in order to get even bigger. So bigger makes you stronger and it can make, you, it can make uh, access to resources cheaper and make things generally easier in, in a large society. So having a, 
a, an organization um, like, like has provided this conference here, where we're all sitting around thinking about un un humanity as a whole, and people coming from all over the world to be here. Uh, that can be done now, and, and it couldn't be done when we were in small groups. But it's because we're in big groups, we're able to actually take a global view of humanity, and as a result, maybe even get concerned about endangered language. So with agriculture, um, and also with pastoralism, so keeping flocks and herds, um, human groups get larger than hunting bands. Um, people settle down wherever they are, because it's easier to stay where they are than keep moving on, if they've got themselves properly organized. But that means that they become um, sitting ducks for robbers, and so they need to organize their own defense. Um, Furthermore, you, since we've identified traditions, of, especially for people who can't speak our language, we know our, language, our people are the people who we can talk to, they begin to um, have a national organization for things like religion. Um, furthermore, um, and when, when you've got the hierarchical society, people at the top want to say that we've got stuff that the rest of the society haven't got. And they start wanting to um, acquire exotic products from further away. Because uh, granted that what's, e what's close is easy to get, but to show that you're important within one of these hierarchical societies, you want to show that you've got stuff that other people haven't got, so you, uh, you're interested in long distance trade. Furthermore, um, it's possible, um, and, and they say that the um, world's oldest labor saving device is robbery. Uh, you can, if you haven't got what you want, it may be easier to go and take it from somebody next door to you, um, especially if they seem to be weaker and a bit less well organized than you are. So, so the result of all these trends is that you get uh, empires arising to organize various parts of the world. Um, so um, there are other things which um, come, another aspect of um, that, that happens through the early organization of human beings. The same thing with, with agriculture, speech communities get, get larger and larger, um, and certainly larger than what we assumed was the beginning. It was just a, there would be each village has its own language. They begin to wish to learn um, languages consciously, sometimes because that gives them access to longer distance relationships, so they get prestige out of that. Um, then, if, if you have widespread religions, often religious language becomes specialized uh, over the, the whole religion, more so than the conversational language that people use. Uh, mixed languages develop to facilitate trade, so um, people, if you're trying to get access to what's available from the other side of the world, uh, you're going to have to have some means of talking to people who unfortunately now speak a different language, and lingua francas begin to arise. These are languages which are there specifically uh, to in enable long distance communication. It's not the only communication you need, I and mean, people, some people nowadays say, why do you need anything other than the lingua franca? But you still need intimate communication, which is different from long distance communication, and it's perhaps better done in a, a more intimate language than the one that you typically learn, say, at school, um, for your uh, social betterment. <coughs> presumably, the reason why. All of us learn English, except for me, who learned my English from my mother's knee. You may not have done. Anyway, um, on the other hand, my mother did always encourage me and said, do things with your languages, Nikki. So she was conscious, of, even though she only knew English, that there was more out there and that that's the thing to think about. Anyway, the result of all this is as well as the rise of empires coming about, and then you also get the rise of specialized means of communication lingua francas, which are more widely useful than individual areas. And you can see, in, I mean, we've, we've, we've zipped uh, really to just yesterday. Now, this, this map shows um, an, an analysis of at least part of the world um, in the middle of the first millennium BC. So it's about um, two and a half thousand years ago. And you can see that already in this era, some of the uh, empires had become pretty large. So we've got the um, 
the empire of Kush, um, which uh, includes uh, much of Egypt um, around uh, as it was in 700 BC. Um, moving to the east, you have this vast area um, which is organized around the Middle East, um, which was the first uh, um, known to be uh, ruled by groups of Assyrians from basically what is now Syria. Um, and um, this was later expanded quite massively by their Indo-European neighbors, the Persians, um, giving us what we can see there as the Persian Empire, uh, all the way, as they say, from Hordu to Kush. Hordu was what the Persians called India, and Kush it was the, uh, the, the, the southern reaches of, uh, of Egypt. And there's now, well, South Sudan is where we're Kush was, in strange in the way that they didn't choose to call that new country, by its old name of Kush. And, but at the same time as this was going on, um, or a little, a, a few centuries later, there was a massive empire growing out of the uh, Huanghe and Yangtze region of, um, of China, and you can see it there. So this is the beginnings of stirring, of large-scale organization, and all of these uh, empires had one major lingua franca which they used in order to communicate around them. Um, a little bit later on, here we can see the world as it was conceived by the most, the best informed people um, in the second century AD. This is the time of the Roman Empire. This is very much a Greek and Roman view of the world. So I'm afraid your part will have <laughs> disappeared off the edge of this, but this side it says at least. Um, but you can see um, here um, the, uh, the major. Uh, language of large-scale um, contact, as far as Europe was aware, was using Greek. It wouldn't have been using Latin because um, the, the Romans never really did progress beyond the area of Asia Minor, but um, um, Greek conquests under Alexander gone further than that, and for a couple of hundred years, the Greek was an extremely effective uh, lingua franca used in um, Western Eurasia, all the way from Spain across to what is now Afghanistan. Um, this is the empire which uh, resulted from, in, um, or the number of empires you could say, which resulted from uh, Alexander's conquests in the uh, 3rd century BC. There's the so-called Seleucid Empire, which was a central area, but the um, Egypt and the Ptolemies were there, the Ptolemaic Empire, and the Greek Bactrian Kingdom across to the west, sorry, across to the extreme east of the Seleucids, and there you are, you can see just the Maurya are there, um, and, and they, they were the ones who were responsible for stopping the advance of Alexander the Great. Um, but it seems that subsequently there was quite a lot of actually diplomatic relationships between the Maoris and later the Guptas and these uh, Greek-speaking empires in what is now the Middle East. <coughs> so by that, that time, about the, after the first uh, century, end of the first century AD, there were major empires um, that the Romans had, had caught up with what was going on in uh, the east of the uh, Mediterranean and unified an empire which included as far as my own country, Britain, but um, and, and, and all the way down into Egypt and uh, the borders of Persia. They were stopped, however, by the Parthians and the Persians um, who um, had unified the area which is now Iran. And there were other empires, the Kushans had come from Central Asia to dominate northern India. The Shakas, Scythians were there. India, the empires in India didn't seem to last quite as long in other places. Perhaps you can give some speculation as to why that should be. But anyway, you, there were large-scale empires for a, a 
two or three generations at a time. And in the Kushan Empire, it was, it was more like three or four hundred years. And at the same time, the Chinese were expanding right over in the east. Um, so um, this is just a, a sort of stating point on the way. Um, part of what happened with the and Roman Empire was that it split into its Greek and Roman-speaking halves. And it turned out that the Greek part lasted a lot longer than the, um, the uh, uh, Latin-speaking part. Um, in fact, a whole millennium longer. In that Rome was conquered by the Goths in the 5th century AD. Um, AD but Constantinople was not conquered by um, the Turks until 1500, 15th, 15th century AD. But um, that's one aspect of, um, exp uh, of, of what actually happened in the world as a result of the trends that I talked about. Um, another thing was the spread of world religions. Um, this map is really from a, a, a different time scale altogether. This is essentially how the world religions ended up um, in something like the beginning of the 20th century. So we moved forward a couple of millennia from our last map. And um, what you can see there is that um, Christianity at this stage um, had, had inherited um, Europe and the Americas. Um, Islam had, was dominating um, North Africa and all the way across to Central Asia. Um, Hinduism had largely, since it isn't a proselytizing religion, it basically stayed where it, had, where it wanted to be. Um, worshipping its gods within India. And there were other um, large-scale areas um, brought together through common acceptance of Buddhism. Um, so I, I omitted to mention Australia, of course, at that stage. Australia was very much uh, part of the Christian world. The Christian world has been given two colours here um, in order to distinguish the Protestants from the Catholics whether that's important. I don't know at this stage. Um, but the languages, um, just, just as, um, by and large, areas with different um, religions will have different lingua francas. Um, so that, for example, the Americas in the South are all um, effectively accessible through Spanish, whereas the, the North of America is accessible through English. Um, the, the Muslim area is um, accessible through Arabic and to a large, even larger extent uh, through Persian. Um, and to a lesser extent, you could say, the, uh, the Buddhist area became accessible through Pali, although it, 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 by and large the political organization which, um, uh, and economic organization which which brought people together didn't make that much use of a known lingua franca, except possibly the marginal use of Persian in the, in the East. Um, some, some languages simply came about as a result of the possibility of trade. These are called pidgin languages. And we can see an incidence of um, pidgin and creole langu languages um, as they are across the world. We can see it's, it's basically an equatorial phenomenon, but um, people have, have come to this area, the, the very um, fertile part of the world, I suppose, which is the equatorial zone, and they tend to meet people that they have absolutely no other contact with, so they devise um, pidgin languages, which exist purely for trade, and as I tend to say, point out in, say, the work I wrote on lingua francas, when the trade goes away, the languages go away as well. But as long as that, that period, languages can come about quite quickly in this context. It'll, you know, these pidgin languages basically grew up in the um, 200 years after about uh, 1650, 1700, as um, European trade spread around the world. So, um, 
generalizing on the, the linguistic effect of empire, uh, we've mentioned that large communities tend to crowd out smaller ones, and when they conquer them by force. And class prejudice becomes associated with power, and so large groups tend to have larger uh, prejudice than the, than the smaller ones, which is something which is very relevant to the lack of respect for endangered languages in our day. And after the axial age, which is the age when the, the major um, proselytizing religions, um, which, which have survived, um, notably Christianity, Islam, and Buddhism, salvation religions may themselves come to be associated with power. And so the result of all this is that the, the little guys, the ones who have not benefited um, or have not participated as much as the others in those latter friends of humanity, of, 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 of falling marginal costs and bigger being better, that, that, that they are left with uh, languages which are potentially endangered. Now you can say, well, obviously the, the um, rise of endangerment um, is a natural thing like everything else I've been talking about. You can think that anything that human beings do is natural. I mean, the, the way we got where we are today by being a pretty much the least natural of the species around the world. But, at any rate, we sort of analyze why what happened had to happen, and that some loss is inevitable. Um, but the point also is that um, we actually have human feelings uh, which to some extent tell against the rather hard uh, considerations of trade and empire and status um, that we've just been talking about. Um, there's a very famous line in Virgil's Aeneid where he says, Sunt lacrimae rerum. It maintain mortalia tangum. Now he's he is the great poet of the Roman Empire. He spends a lot of time saying why it is right that Rome should take over the whole world. In some sense, because they are better, um, or because they've got the mandate of Jupiter or something. But nevertheless, um, they feel for um, what is being lost. So they say lacrimae rerum. This is a strange phrase in Latin. There are tears of things. So that means there are a, there's a sort of sadness which is in, implicit in the way things are. It maintain mortalia tangle, and the fact that things die continues to affect us and make us concerned. I mean, it's something, you know, maybe that's part of the reason why we are moved by tragedy, say, um, is this feeling that. Why do things have to die? Can we not do something? In the same way, I suppose it's in a, a projection of what we feel in, the, in, in having a family. Obviously, the youngest members of the family are the weakest, and the ones who, if you didn't care for them, would probably not survive. But you learn that, well, you, you have an inevitable feelings within you, saying that you want to preserve those smaller, weaker members for their, their, their uh, contribution. And in a way, I mean, that's why, why else would you honor your, your granny or your other answer? Well, partly because they, they, they may know stuff that you don't know. Um, and that, of course, was, was very much the case before the origin of literary traditions. But nowadays, especially when the world is changing so fast, you may you get the situation where young children know more than their parents and grandparents about how to get by in the modern world. They don't know why they know it, but nevertheless they're more attuned to the way things are. Like and so, because things are moving faster, it, it's harder um, for, the, for, for the, your, your granny to have cash value, so to speak. Um, you, you, so, to some extent, it becomes more of an emotional thing, but an important thing nonetheless. Um, all these things that we... Um, Part of the reason that, that human beings could spread around the world is because we invented, we discovered new things and, and created new traditions in different parts of the world. And we turned out to be very flexible in doing that. If we, um, having taken over the whole world, as we might by and large have now, um, we, we forget the skills that we had which took us there, 
I, in some sense, that may be an endangering thing for the human race as a whole. We don't know. But um, the, the rising concern about things like global warming uh, suggests that, in fact, we do need to try and um, learn something from our past. So, how do we go about organizing peace so that people aren't going to um, bully each other into extinction? Well, the Roman way is through power. Um, we were reading it Virgil again, and he says, Imperium sine fine deli. This is Jupiter talking to the Roman uh, hero Aeneas and saying, I have given you empire without end. And sine fine can mean, a, it can mean without, in, in every direct, of, of, in every direction, um, like in the way that um, I think the, the Guptas talk of Dishantara Rajam. So that's um, empire to the, to the boundaries of, of what you can see in every direction. So that, that the, the, the Latin equivalent of that is Imperium Sine Fine. And he also, you give the right, Parkisque Impono Remone, so impose on people the custom of peace that will make them, will make them do it because it's good for them. And of course, it's good for us too. Uh, we want humanity is better off if it is um, unified by force. And so, another Roman emperor, about 100, 150 years later, um, put on his coins that he was Dominus Totius Orbis. He was the lord of the whole world. And a little bit um, after that, uh, somebody who became em emperor for uh, less than a year, because it was the year of four emperors in 68 AD, um, put on his coins, Pax Orbis Terrarum, peace of the whole world, peace of the cycle of land. Um, not far away, in, well, far, not in the next major center to the east in India, um, the Guptas were talking of there being Chakravati, someone who keeps worlds on its wheels, is keeping, keeps, keeps on rowing, and creating what uh, a realm which is Sarva Hauma, something of all the lands, a universe. Um, and another way of uh, approaching peace, so that was uh, the way of uh, force of arms, and another way of doing it is to use some sort of um, the Christian idea, you could say, suffer little children to come unto me um, through love and serenity. And it's interesting that the same word, Pax, which in um, Roman Latin means power coming, uh, unifying power coming through uh, strength, so it's got to do with empire, has in the Catholic Church become a sign of uh, tenderness. Pax will be well, this group, if you wish that something, you're not trying to bully them, you're trying to actually hope that they will grow like the younger members of your family. And interestingly, in, in one of the furthest domains of the Roman Catholic Church, <coughs> Ireland, the word for a kiss is Paul, which is derived directly from the Latin word pac, pacem. So, um, in this part of the world, you have the, tra the tradition of shanti, shanti, shanti. Um, which again, is, is not a threatening thing at all, and uh, is, is, a, is a fostering sign of something in the top of the world. But, there is the old Roman maxim, si vis pacem, para bello. And the idea is that in some ways people are more uh, likely to see their own interests as being uh, peaceable if you threaten them, if you show that you're not going to be pushed around, so they do better to um, be your friend. Hmm. So, um, one or two things which are going to come up, I think, in the course of this week, uh, here and there. Um, although empire is the great threat to diversity, nevertheless it is through empires that we've come to know how much diversity there has been. So that in, in a way, as I was saying, you know, because we, we, this, this conference is the result of, of, um, of a civilization which organizes things, large units, and so specializes in this, um, particular interests. Um, 
the, the people who um, actually hold this diversity by speaking minority languages, for example, often are not are the ones who are least aware of how much diversity there is, and why would they care about that? They want to, to, to foster their own things. They don't want to foster the diversity of humanity, for its own sake, as people who may be linguists or um, speakers of a large lingua francas may want to promote diversity, but then they're not actually part of it. The people who hold the diversity, who speak the small languages, know their own intimacy and their individual heritage. And they also, uh, another thing, uh, inevitably, because part of that is that they are away from centers of power in their own societies. So there's a considerable problem to bridge here. Um, I don't think we'll talk too much about Armenia. I first gave this talk at a conference in the middle of that area on the borders of Turkey and Armenia, which is what we were talking about here. Uh, so I don't think we'll um, give you the details there. We can go back to Armenia if you get interested. But um, so what you need um, to establish a large scale standard is a lingua franca. But to stress the, the diversity that makes you know, the varieties of a language interesting, you need vernaculars. So unity is there for outward strength, but diversity is in some sense a token of wealth. So the uni unity uh, defends the diversity, ideally. And now I come on to the sort of plug for the Foundation for Endangered Languages. Um, we've been going for about uh, 20 years in a, in a very small way, but um, talking to people at least, um, to, to support, enable, and assist the documentation, protection, and promotion. That means the, in some sense, the revitalization of endangered languages. Uh, and, well, basically we had a conference, this, this, is two, this was written, written three or four years ago, so it was only 18 annual conferences at that stage. Uh, they're all in different parts of the world. They each on a different aspect of endangered languages. And uh, it, as I was talking about earlier this morning, um, you can see how those different aspects relate to each other through my little um, Sanskrit talk. Um, each one is um, <coughs> global. That's the age conference is, is global, but not regional. It obviously has to be in a particular place. So um, two years ago, <coughs> just at the end of last year, we had our 20th conference in Hyderabad in India, and we've just had our 21st conference, and that was in Alcanena on the borders of Portugal and Spain. So that was typical, I and mean, we, we move all over the world. And here are some of the, the, the covers of the books which you will be able to see, and we shall get them out some stage after the next break. Um, so what we're trying to do by those conferences is to share techniques and perceptions, to build solidarity and friendship. And it's important, we think, in these conferences that there should not be parallel sessions. Any more there will be any parallel sessions in this conference, everybody will hear everybody else. Um, so, some people don't like to think of their language as endangered. They think, no, we can stand up for ourselves. And in, in any case, it's, it's in itself shows a lack of respect for language endangered. But in some cases, you have to. Um, well, one, one way of, of building an endangered language is not to accept the endangered, but to go on speaking it regardless. That would work, I suppose. But in, in some cases, the morale is low. And you need actually to point, at, point to a language as having difficulty and not being transmitted to the next generation. In order for it to get itself organized and for the morale to return. So that's basically the, problem, the paradox of the end, which underlies the foundation for endangered languages. Um, so, in short, we use the united strength of any lingua franca, such as English at the moment, and knowledge derived from its global position to give access to the diverse wealth of your chosen vernacular language. And that is eff effectively um, my uh, sort of opening cri de coeur um, for you. That yes, endangerment is intrinsic to the human condition, and it's, it comes from our long term history, but there are good reasons for wanting to resist the um, the deprivations of, um, of, of untrammeled humanity and 
still a somewhat more nuanced and uh, friendly approach to all the diversity which we still have in the world. Okay, that's it. been distressed every morning to wake up and think that they were, now I will hear more news of Brexit. <laughs> and by and large, it's just a, 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 a national sorrow, it seems to me. But it, I suppose it's a national sorrow which um, is of, of a part with, with uh, global political trends at the moment, which have to do with populism and um, a concern. Well, it, 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 in a way, it's it's the concern of small groups who do not have their own languages, but nevertheless feel they have been um, demeaned um, by the, the state's interest in other things, whether in immigrants or um, foreign policy or um, scientific developments, from which they all feel in some way alienated. Um, how we shall solve this um, to some extent, it can be solved it by giving giving a voice to the people who have not been um, who feel that they have not been interested uh, or uh, have not been considered. But ultimately, I think that the, the solution is going to lie in um, re-educating all of society so that we become um, more uh, more careful and more. Um, more concerned for each other. Um, the way we have to organize the economic system at the moment, it had, seems to me, I don't know whether this is, uh, it strikes people in, in India as much as it does, but that the, the very richest people get richer, and everybody else gradually gets poorer and poorer. Even though, I mean, you have all got all sorts of goods and things uh, and access uh, to, to wonderful properties which you didn't have in the past. But relatively, there is a polarization in society. Um, I, I personally don't think that our Prime Minister is following the best path of her, but uh, no doubt she, she has bigger problems than I do in order to, to resolve these things. And she, not least among her problems is the Conservative Party of the United Kingdom. And by, by and large, we, we see that the, the way we are organized politically has made this problem worse rather than better. So the fact that we cannot actually run an election which gives us a, a representative result is another problem that we, is a major problem for us within, within that area. Um, I, I, the, the particular quote that you, know, you were talking about, that if you are a, see yourself as a citizen of the world, you are a citizen of nowhere, was the Prime Minister talking to the section of society which is, she is trying to represent. It's not the section of society with which she has spent her career representing, but she, as she assesses the political situation at the moment, she feels she has to make a somewhat aggressive statement on behalf of people who consider themselves historically to have been disadvantaged. But I don't think that the ultimate solution we'll find is in that direction. communities 
who have the future in their hands. And in, in some sense, it's, it's a matter of morale uh, and false consciousness, which is the main problem. So you can talk about the problem, but in fact, in a, you're doing the best you can to change the problem simply by talking about it. That's my answer. Yes. Is that working? Yeah. Well, I can do it. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, no, keep it so everybody else can do it. Actually, first of all, I congratulate you for being very much aware of the place, time, and majority of the, most of the ethnic group of people are here. Just because you are promoting only Sanskrit and Greek Latin, mm. there are a lot of uh, cluster languages in this world which are on the verge of extinction, mm. like Hebrew, like Tamil, well, <laughs> and so on. I think there are better than the in Tamil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I just mean that uh, <laughs> there are so much classical languages which are far older than Tamil, mm -hmm. which is speakable. Because it's very obvious that uh, language deals with the community and society. Uh, languages like Hebrew and Sanskrit belong to the close community. Where uh, personally, I can tell my life experience. I tried my best to learn Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. Where I couldn't able it, I've been stopped. I came to Alikam University and enrolled myself in uh, Quranic Arabic. I've been welcomed with a number of people. They, they welcomed me with a lot of cheers. That love I uh, like very much in this university. <laughs> so if you love your people to learn other language, <laughs> <there's> no, <laughs> that is enough for. Uh, you know, for the language to grow centuries to centuries, no, uh, like, in fact, no influence can stop it from learning. There is no chance for extinction. So, I mean, you should have concentrated more on other parts rather than being optimistic. Well, yes, I mean, what you're saying is that you have encountered diversity through learning different classical languages, and Arabic and Sanskrit are good I'm, I'm sorry that you found Arabic more welcoming than, than Sanskrit was. Well, uh, I, I hope that will no, not be I, I, uh, I don't want to identify, uh, show my identity that I'm from a uh, Dravidian background. Or from, uh, oh. But I love every language. Being a learner of Arabic, I love Sanskrit very much. Mm -hmm. And Tamil too. Yeah. Okay, yes, right. Well, but the, I mean, the invention of writing was uh, something which came in big societies. It seems a lot of it had to do with large-scale administration, which was not necessary in small society. And then it came to be realized that it was a, it was a cultural um, tool as well, that you could write down anything you could say, and then these, you therefore had a new way of preserving and enhancing the literature. But, and, and that's a historic fact, and, that, and that just as you uh, got, get your knowledge of diversity through Sanskrit and um, and Arabic, I got my sense of diversity to start with through Latin and French and German and Greek and Turkish and then Japanese and so on. So, but all of these are uh, the languages of large scale organizations and they continue to be that. But at a certain point, you begin to realize that the, the diversity goes beyond these small, these, these relatively large units. We wouldn't know exactly. I mean, it's, it's it's together with the point I mean that it is the privilege of empire to know diversity, not to actually be diverse, but to see it and then hopefully not crush it out of existence. Um, but that doesn't mean that you, you can't rejoice in the big ones as well, because even the diversity that they have is, is, is good. And at the same time, when I saw the map of India, mm -hmm. you uh, just over the Kodi Mori Empire, Gupta Empire, there are so many empires which have been. Uh, Yes. Well, the, 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 this is the funny thing about India is you keep knocking your empires down. Why is it? Probably a good, good practice. Yeah. Uh, I think India is a country of diversity. There are so many sentiments of interest. Yes. Welcome after the lunch. Um, maybe on behalf of uh, Professor Nicholas Osler, I should tell you that he has arranged the uh, proceedings of earlier conferences of the Foundation for Endangered Languages 
you can have educated. It's only for looking at it, nothing else. But the brochures are there which you can take home. So those things are there you can take, but not these ones. Uh, we had a lot of discussion um, in the morning, and I'll probably take two from whatever has been discussed uh, there and um, try to develop whatever it should do uh, in this country. Uh, language is something which is, uh, um, you know, very, I should say, grossly misunderstood in this country. Probably I will start with that. Um, most of the grammars that are prescribed textbooks in our schools are not grammars of those languages in most cases. Um, and probably I should uh, uh, mention very briefly about the fact um, I was um, one of the authors of uh, the Odia grammars from class 6 to class 10 uh, and these books were published by the Board of Secondary Education Odisha. But you know since we talked about um, uh, or we discussed the grammar of the Uriya language which is used right now. Uh, one of the earlier author, I mean, uh, the authors of earlier books um, and his relative, they um, uh, fired a lawsuit in the Odisha High Court stating that whatever we had written was not a grammar of the Uriya language. And the High Court ruling was that whatever we wrote was not a grammar of the Uriya language. So such things do happen in this country. Uh, that's why I am saying that language is not very important, very crucial. Now, um, it is uh, by uh, the... Um, it is a, you can say that India largely a country of immigrants. If you, um, whatever Professor Oskler showed you in the morning, everything starts from Africa, moves out and all these things. So India is largely a country of immigrants. Now, if we accept this, then it's obvious that we should have to be multilingual, multicultural, etc. Et there is no you know, other book for that. Okay. Now, keeping that in a view, uh, I would like to discuss um, multilingualism, uh, is it uh, causing language endangerment or what, that kind of thing. And here when we are talking about these things, obviously it is an issue of home language and school language. Obviously, you know, you cannot uh, avoid that. Because when a child um, is born, acquires the language of uh, the home and uh, the uh, immediate uh, social environment. But when he goes to us, when she goes to school, in many cases it's a different language or different dialect. And that, you know, creates problems. And um, um, I, of course, um, I'll probably discuss a um, um, little later about the data, taking data from the census of India. Before that, I'll, I, whatever presentation I have, I'll do that. Um, India has been claimed to be a multilingual state since the uh, prehistoric times. According to the 2001 census um, uh, India report, there are 122 languages spoken in this country, out of which 22 are scheduled languages and the remaining 100 are non scheduled languages. The civil languages are constitutionally recognized and enjoy government patronage and support for various purposes, whereas the non civil languages are to a large extent unprivileged and most of them do not get any support from either the central or the state governments. Um, in the morning there was a question of classical language. 
its language is a, has become a matter of politics in this country. Um, because, look, languages are trying to be classical, to be, I mean, turn classical. So that kind of problem is happening. So we won't discuss all those things at all. Because in, once you start discussing those things, we are not discussing linguistics, we are discussing politics. And you saw that Tamil became the first classical language in this country, then Sanskrit, then Telugu and Kannada, then uh, Malayalam, and finally Odia, the language that I speak. So these things are happening. And Marathi tried very hard but couldn't become the classical language, and I know why it couldn't become, become the classical language. So these things are happening. We won't discuss such things at all. Here we are primarily talking about language endangerment issues. Small languages will concentrate on those. According to Article 350A of the Indian Constitution, all Indian children are entitled for instruction in their mother tongues at the primary level. And I quote, it shall be the endeavor of every state and every local authority within the state to provide adequate facilities for instruction in the mother tongue at the primary stage of education to children belonging to linguistic minorities. Uh, uh, and the president may issue such directions to any state as he considers necessary or proper for securing the provision for such facilities. It's a part of our constitution. The constitution states that every Indian child is um, uh, has a right to be educated in the mother tongue till, uh, uh, up to the primary stage, uh, in the primary stage, class 5. Then Article 350B underlines, and I quote, there shall be special officer for linguistic minorities to be appointed by the president. Two, uh, it shall be the duty of the special officer, uh, officer to investigate all matters relating to the safeguards provided for linguistic minorities under this constitution and report to the president upon these matters at such intervals as the, president's, as, the, as the president may direct. And the president shall cause all such reports to be laid before this, uh, each house of parliament and sent to the governments of the state concerned. There is nothing like that I have heard happening in this country. Nothing uh, like this. Now, uh, one more point I must mention here that uh, the Commission for Minorities, it should also deal with linguistic minorities. But this commission primarily deals with religious minorities, not with linguistic minorities. What it means is that languages are not um, a resource in this country, not treated as a resource in this country. If we are a multilingual country, we must emphasize languages which is not happening. It's evident from these provisions that India has to promote multilingualism with all sincerity, but the ground realities are different. According to the 1981 Census of India report, there are no Indian schools in which the non scheduled languages are taught or were taught except a few states like Madhya Pradesh, Manipur, Meghalaya and Sikkim. Till 81, no non scheduled languages, uh, uh, these languages were never taught. The tribal children who speak a minor or a tribal language usually go to those schools where the state language uh, is used as a medium of instruction. Even those tribal languages which are spoken by a large majority of speakers, for example, Kui, a tribal language, uh, Dravidian tribal language in Odisha, Savara, a Munda tribal language in Andhra Pradesh, are not used as a medium of instruction in Odisha and Andhra Pradesh. And most of the tribal language speaking children show poor performance in various school examinations. Cummins, Skatna, Kangas, Tokuma and Skatna Kangas have demonstrated a close relation between high level of proficiency in the home language and academic success in the school language. Because of the existing gap between the home and school languages in India, most minority language speaking children are deprived, are deprived of the benefits of educational facilities provided by the government of India. Scholars like Carrasquillo and Rodriguez have argued, I quote, transferability of skills from 
one language to another appears to play a critical role in second language acquisition. This is because there exists a transfer of universal linguistic characteristics and knowledge acquired from one language to another." Unquote. These are very relevant for the following recommendations of the National Research Council. Um, I am a little reluctant uh, you know, to quote, but I must quote that. If language minority children arrive at school with no proficiency in English, but speaking a language for which there are instructional guides, learning materials, and locally available proficient teachers, then these children should be taught how to read their uh, native language while acquiring proficiency in spoken English. Then subsequently taught to extend their skills to reading English." Unquote. You know, these are all, this is an American um, uh, uh, vision. But I'm, uh, that's why I said I'm reluctant because India is a multilingual country. America is not. And for you, uh, those of you who know, I have heard it from one of my uh, friends uh, who told me a joke, of course. Uh, if you know more than two languages, you are multilingual. In the American context, I am saying. If you know two languages, you are bilingual. If you know one language, you are American. So that is the definition of American, so that kind of thing. Um, so here, see what kind of thing is happening. But the norm in uh, India today is extremely disappointing. In the so-called English medium schools, the students are usually discouraged and punished if they are found by the teachers speaking in the scheduled languages, not to speak of the non scheduled languages. See, it says that if a child comes with a language, that is to be promoted, but these things are not happening at all. Cummings and Swine have proposed two types of language proficiencies for two di uh, different purposes. Of course, many of you may know that, but even then I should mention it. That is basic interpersonal communication skills or BICs for day-to-day -day communication and cognitive academic language proficiency or CAL for academic communication. It needs to be mentioned that English vocabulary has made an inroad even into the normal communication in villages in India. Most of the Indian language programs, including Hindi programs on television, frequently code switch between the Indian languages and English. If you watch our uh, the religious channels, you will see what kind of English uh, they are using. Many, many English expressions are being used even in our religious uh, channels which uh, 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 televise religious programs. As a result, this pattern is followed by most people in the country, even the top political leaders who are accepted as role models by many uh, young masses um, uh, are noticed to be doing the same. As a result, the distinction between Bix and Cal has diminished and it is certainly leading to undesired results in academic achievements. Though India has officially implemented the three language formula that includes the first language of the uh, community, Hindi and English in the 1960s, the multilingualism figures among uh, um, the uh, let's say various language speakers in this country is uh, are very disappointing uh, i come to that um, after a while all these certainly require a fresh look um, uh, 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 at the linguistic situation in india which does not have a proper language policy till date even you do not know which languages are easier to learn for which language speaking communities Stern's statement is very relevant here, and I quote, uh, the learning uh, of a second language must be regarded as a necessary part of total personality formation in the modern world, since it should enable a person to live and move freely in more than one culture and free him from the limitations imposed um, by belonging to and being educated within a single social so single cultural group and a single linguistic community." Unquote. The slogan in India and in many other countries in the world should be what? Parker, 1961, the then Secretary of the Modern Languages, Languages Association of America stated. Again, I am reluctant, but I love to quote him. He is an American. I am an Indian, but I am quoting him. I have no other go. And he said, one language makes a wall. It takes two to make a gate. And uh, in fact, I would I have extended that uh, in one of my recent talks somewhere. I said that 
Three languages make a door. So, you know, gate is not important for us. Gate door is important so that you can go inside, stay home, so that kind of thing. So, three languages make a door. So, in this country, we must talk about multilingual education. Now, uh, uh, today's uh, talk is multilingualism and language endangerment. You know, this is uh, actually mostly a Western view. Because you must have seen that if you look at the books and uh, uh, papers published by the Westerners, you would say that most of them um, talk about bilingualism. Hardly you will find multilingualism here and there. Mostly bilingualism. And so far, whatever I quoted, everything is bilingualism only and nothing else. But in India, we must talk about you know, multilingualism. Um, the Western, the so-called advanced societies, I will tell you an example where uh, language endangerment has taken place not because of multilingualism or bilingualism, not because of that. According to an estimate, uh, two, 250 to 350 indigenous languages before, were there before the arrival of the European um, immigrants um, uh, in uh, the United States of America two centuries ago. But at present, 155 out of the 175 Native American languages are in the endangered category. I'm putting again cross. I'm not giving you those details. Then the European Union declared 2001 as the <coughs> European Year of Languages, and the desired goal was to lay the foundation for a multilingual Europe. I quote, all those living compulsory education, all those living compulsory education should be able to communicate in at least two European languages. Uh, in addition to their mother tongue and then be able to build on that knowledge for the rest of their lives in one quote. This was the goal of uh, that uh, European Europe languages. But the ground realities seem contradictory. Many European countries believe that and I am quoting from Smith, knowledge of the heritage language is something that is unnecessary at best and detrimental to integration into the dominant society at worst, unquote. See, I know this is what uh, an European scholar, a, a European scholar is saying. This is clearly reflected in the withdrawal of funding for various heritage language teaching programs in European public schools. After a detailed analysis of the Australian situation, Fishman has come to a grim conclusion that these Aboriginal languages do not have any long-term survival prospects. As you know, the American, um, uh, the American, sorry, the uh, uh, British uh, went to the United States of America uh, not many centuries ago. And all of a sudden, the American Indians didn't become bilingual. As a result, their language was endangered, you know, that kind of thing. So, that multilingualism leads to language endangerment is not a very uh, uh, strong kind of uh, uh, view. That's why it's a weak view. It may happen, but we'll discuss that. Therefore, it can be argued that monolingualism is the fundament on which the linguistic structures have been built in the Western world, whereas multilingualism is the very basis of the Indian society. Most of the Adivasi or primitive languages have diminished in the US and Australia within hardly two centuries of occupation of the European immigrants, whereas hundreds of languages have survived on the Indian soil through millennia. Indian languages have learned to coexist uh, though they have converged with each other at the same time, maintain their individual identities. Here, of course, all of you, uh, I'll refer to you know, India as a linguistic area by MNO. This has been demonstrated um, uh, by Gumpers and Wilson's study um, um, of the uh, Kupwar village. The three languages spoken in this village are Kannada, a Dravidian language, Urdu and Marathi that belong to the indo aryan family. Bilingualism and multilingualism in this village uh, um, are widespread and it is common to see people switching back and forth between at least two languages. This has made the grammatical structures of these three languages so similar that a word-for-word -word translation rendering among them is possible. Dakini is another good example whose vocabulary is mostly Indo-Aryan and grammatical structure predominantly Dravidian. Finnegan and uh, Besnier have called this phenomenon, it's a very interesting expression, having your cake and eating it too. 
and I like that thing. Though Maya Scarpun has argued that, and I quote her, code switching is involved in language death. And at least some instances of language death may involve the pervasive addition or substitution of the grammar of another language in the code switching situation. Unquote. The Cookwood and Deccani examples do not substantiate her argument. Since uh, she has elaborated her uh, views on the basis of African languages, it can be claimed that the linguistic situation of India is different not only from that of the Western world, but also from the African one. He, uh, when I am telling you that you know India has not lost many languages, I will give an example. The data in 1961, uh, according to the Census of India report, there were 1,652 mother tongues, and according to 2001 census, India has 1,635 mother tongues. So that means there is a uh, decline of 17 mother tongues in the last, you know, uh, 40 years. Some people also claim that 800 languages are lost, something like that. Don't believe all those statements because those they are not at all qualified statements. It is of course true that many languages known to us have died over a period of time and such a natural death is inevitable. Some major and powerful languages like Sanskrit and various practices that received support from rulers, religious leaders and the masses are included in it. But so far, as the minor languages are concerned, uh, um, Lo Bianco and Raiduen have proposed two types of loss. I quote, an abrupt, dislocative and extreme form of a uh, form and a slower generational attrition. The former often results in the total disruption of all transmission and of any later uh, relearning prospects of the language. While the second can at best retain within the living memory of spe uh, different speak uh, speakers sufficient language resources on which to base a revival or renewal activity. Uh, the former may be called language loss by rupture and the latter language loss by attrition, unquote. Though they make this distinction with reference to the ind indigenous languages of Australia, <coughs> it's applicable to the loss of minor languages in general. Interestingly, language loss by rupture is typically a western phenomenon and it has hardly taken place in India. But the second type of loss, language loss by attrition, is a common uh, feature across the Indian subcontinent. It's interesting to note that when uh, the Western world has been quite enthusiastic and active in protecting the small and endangered languages, um, um, no, has been um, enthusiastic in protecting endangered languages. In his general introduction to the Encyclopedia of the World's Endangered Languages, Christopher Mosley states, and I quote him, in the past decade, leading up to the publication of this encyclopedia, there have been various initiatives to foster awareness of the accelerating rate of the loss of languages. The UNESCO Red Book, which appeared in 1993, was a pioneering effort in this direction. Then, in 1995, the University of Tokyo set up a clearing house for endangered languages, the emphasis being on recording newly discovered instances of disappearing languages rather than taking action to preserve them. Then swiftly followed the creation of activist groups on both sides of the Atlantic in 1995. Uh, in the languages, that's what Professor Hasni mentioned in the morning, in the United States of America, the Endangered Languages Fund, and in Britain, the Foundation for Endangered Languages, which is headed by Nicholas Postler. These bodies have taken an active part in actual preservation of indigenous languages by acting as charitable grant giving bodies which make awards to scholars who are doing valuable investigative work. They stipulate that the published results of the work undertaken shall benefit the community concerned. The prestige of the study of indigenous languages was, was further enhanced in 2002 with the creation of the first university chair in the subject by Rousing Foundation at the School of Oriental and African Studies, which you didn't mention, Professor Hasnain, in the morning. This foundation, too, is engaged in giving grants to uh, for fresh projects that it deems will assist in language recovery on court. 
It's well known that language endangerment is not an independent subject of study in most Indian universities. Though the linguistic situation in, in, in India is very complex, the language planning activities certainly do not match with their complexity and therefore there have been super uh, 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 therefore these have been superficial to a great extent. Schiffman has proposed the concept of linguistic culture that greatly influences the prospects of a country's language policy. He has argued that unless we understand the covert linguistic culture of a country that consists of the belief systems, ideas and attitudes about languages, we cannot achieve success in implementing the overt language policies. I am not aware of any detailed study conducted to discover the covert linguistic culture of this country. So it's natural for the overt language policies to lay hidden in the files of the government offices. We know that the Indian society is in an unprecedented flux of, and transition and a large num number of Indians belonging to different strata have been making efforts to join the national, international mainstream which has been radically affected by the global economic changes. As a result, the good old joint family structure has broken down and nuclear families are the trend now. All these people live in houses and the concept of home has become a thing of the past. They are uprooted from the homeland and have left the home language behind. I quote mostly again, I quote, linguists who are outsiders must be sufficiently well trained as an anthropologists. Sufficiently observant and methodical as scientists and sufficiently compassionate and sensitive as human beings to be able to tackle both of these problems heads on. When a language is on the threshold of extinction, its speakers may well be demoralized in other non-linguistic ways as well. Economically deprived, dependent on aid, malnourished, unable or unwilling to draw on their cultural or religious traditions, any combination of these factors is possible. While it is not reasonable to accept the language to provide for all of these trends, it is impossible to act as if one were unaware of them. And as students of linguistics, we must you know, remember all these things and start acting accordingly." Unquote. Ostler, who is sitting here, has made an interesting observation. In the world's top 20, all the languages have their origin in the south or east of Asia or in Europe. What does account for their growth then? It's noticeable that a great many of the languages, that is 9 out of 20, are spoken in the civilizations sustained by rice as a staple crop, such as Bengali, Japanese, Korean, Wu, uh, and Yu Chinese, Javanese, Tamil, Marathi, Vietnamese. Evidently, rice is capable of supporting dense and extensive populations and its cultivation uh, through controlled flooding requires a high level of organization. Other languages which are not predominantly in the rice area are spoken in the neighboring areas that have assumed political control of the rice areas such as Mandarin, Chinese and Hindi Urdu which are linguistically in direct continuum if they are distinct at all." Unquote. These interesting observations strengthen the above hypothesis that a relationship of rootedness to a land is a key factor in conservation of languages. The implication is that a change in the physical environment will obviously alter the linguistic and cultural environment of the concerned society. Due to large-scale migrations from villages to towns, cities as well as rapid spread of the urban pop culture, the second generation everywhere has neither a homeland nor a home language. They are part of a mostly mainstream which is essentially similar all over the world. That's what being discussed uh, in the morning with reference to the British Prime Minister. You know, her observation that, you know, if you do this, you are not, um, you, are, you belong to the whole world. It needs to be mentioned here that the older generation living in Indian villages are not familiar not at all familiar with the English calendar. Their life moves according to the traditional Indian calendar, which most of the Indian, more modern citizens do not know. I assure you, 
if you ask most you know, uh, citizens, highly educated citizens, to name the 12 months um, that, uh, according to the Indian ca calendar, they won't be able to do that. And I have tried and I have failed. Um, another important thing, um, um, but many of these, the present generation Indian citizens find it difficult to name five flowers, five fruits. And a lot of students are sitting here, my students, and I have asked them many questions. Can you name five flowers? They start, you know, recalling then uh, a small gap after a few seconds gap after first one, second one, third one, so that kind of thing. And um, uh, in their own languages, uh, they may know more words for these in English or Hindi, but they have, uh, but they have seen them either in the books on television. Somebody uh, tells me ostrich, eagle. All sorts of names I hear from, you know, to talk about five birds, ostrich, eagle, you know, some such names I also hear from these people. Uh, needless to say that uh, um, I wanted to skip something. Uh, how much time, uh, Professor Hasanin, I can take so that I will organize myself accordingly? We'll have a discussion. Okay, then I will, okay, yeah, that's probably. Um, no, yeah, I want to mention something here. That maybe after that I'll um, do, I'll uh, summarize the whole thing. Um, all of you know about uh, Benjamin Lee Wolf, but I want to quote him and uh, discuss in detail what he has done. Um, here I would uh, uh, cite what uh, Benjamin Lee Wolf um, observed regarding the cause of fire accident, uh, fire accidents in the United States those days. I now quote. My analysis was directed toward purely physical conditions such as defective wiring, presence or lack of air spaces between uh, metal flues and uh, woodwork etc. and the results were presented in these terms. Indeed it was undertaken with no thought that any other significances would or could be revealed. But in due course, it became evident that not only a physical situation qua physics, but the meaning of that situation to people in the start of the fire. And this factor of meaning was clearest when it was a linguistic meaning, deciding in the name of the linguistic description commonly applied to the situation. Thus, around a storage of what are called gasoline drums, behavior will tend to a certain type that is, great care will be exercised. While around a storage of what are called empty gasoline drums, it will tend to be different, different, careless, with little repression of smoking or tossing cigarette stubs about. Yet the empty drums are, are perhaps the more dangerous since they contain explosive vapor. Physically, the situation is hazardous, but the linguistic analysis, according to regular analogy, must employ the word empty, which inevitably suggests a lack of hazard. You know, because the gas um, um, uh, drums were called empty uh, uh, gasoline drums, this empty created a kind of idea in the mind of the users that they treated them as empty for which such accidents were taking place. What I'm trying to say is that if we, we know everything in a much better way in the mother tongue. Now, if we start speaking another language, the other tongue which we are not very uh, competent in and all sorts of things, problems are going to be there. Probably, um, now I will uh, come to, since it is multilingualism uh, and all these things, um, I should, uh, how would you like if I say that India is not a multilingual country? Uh, this is, of course, Professor India's husband has heard it very recently. I'm sorry for that, but for him, nobody else has heard that. I have been now very um, uh, vociferously arguing that India is not a multilingual country because uh, when you talk about multilingualism, you definitely uh, a person who knows many languages is multilingual, but uh, that is not the case in the case of India. I have got the data. Uh, it's from 2001 census data. I'll give you the bilingualism and trilingual, uh, tri trilingualism figures among different you know, speech communities. Uh, Hindi, the most powerful language of the country. 
the trilingualism figures are 2.13 percent. It means 98 percent of the Hindi speakers are not trilingual. Um, come to bilingualism figures, 11.95 percent of the Hindi speakers are bilingual. It means 88 percent of the Hindi speakers are not bilingual. Come to Tamil, which is always competing with Hindi. 3.19% of the Tamil speakers are trilingual. That means 97% of the Tamil speakers are not trilingual. Come to bilingualism figures, they are little better. 21.51% are bilingual. That means 80% of Tamil speakers or 79% of Tamil speakers are not bilingual. Then of course Bengali is the third one. Bengali has to compete with Tamil also. Now, because they are only, you know, single point uh, kind of, uh, it's a single digit uh, trilingualism figures. Uh, among the Bengalis, it's 6.52 Nazarene. So, 6.52% of the uh, Bengali speakers are trilingual, that means 94%, or let's 93% are not trilingual. Come to bilingualism, 20.40 are bilingual, that means almost 80% of Bengali speakers are not bilingual. So if this is the case, then I mean, what is happening? Come to the letter entrance into Schedule 8, Konkani. Trilingualism figures are 47.18, bilingualism 74.38. Come to Sindhi, 35.58 uh, uh, trilingualism figures, bilingualism figures are 73.19. Dogri, 26.49 bilingualism figures. And 59.44 trilingualism, 26.49 trilingualism figures and bilingualism figures are 59.44. Bodo, 18.64 bilingual trilingualism, 57.38 trilingualism, uh, bilingualism, sorry, 18.64 trilingualism, 57.38 bilingualism. So this is what is happening. Now, if you look at the bilingualism and trilingualism figures of the scheduled and non scheduled languages, 22, 22 scheduled languages and 100 non scheduled languages, it will be 17.82 trilingualism figures. Bilingual figures are 42.30. Compare it with the non scheduled language speakers. 17.83 trilingualism figures. That means there is almost no difference between the trilingualism figures of the scheduled language speakers and the non scheduled language speakers. What has happened to our three language formula? And all the scheduled language speakers should have gone to a school where three language formula you know, um, uh, was implemented and all these three languages were, uh, were taught. What has happened to that? Now, um, another uh, uh, piece of information probably I should mention. Uh, here that uh, you know um, the trilingualism figures and bilingual figures these are now we have discussed that 96.56 percent of Indians speak the 22 scheduled languages 96.56 percent of the Indians speak the 22 scheduled languages the remaining 1,613 mother tongues are spoken by 3.44% of the Indians. So this is the situation. Another piece of information, a look at the four major language families. I am giving the data again from 2001 census. Indo-European languages, call it Indo-Aryan languages, 76.86% speak Indo-Aryan languages. That means almost 77% people speak Indo-Aryan languages. Dravidian languages 20.82, almost 21% speak Dravidian languages. Austroasiatic uh, languages, Khasi, Santali, etc., etc., 1.1%. 1 1% speak Austroasiatic languages. tibet Burman languages are spoken by only 1% people. But one piece of information which I must share with you is that the number of Tibet Burman languages given in that census report is more than the number of Indo Aryan, Dravidian, Austro Asiatic languages put together. So, this is the linguistic situation in this country. And um, 
multilingualism doesn't india is a multilingual not a multilingual country i hope all of you will agree with me you can ask me questions later that's not a problem now we are um hathi ke daan khane ke liye alag hote hain dikhane ke liye alag hote hain nicolas um, the elephants um, um uh, yeah uh, no let me translate it literally teeth are different to show and different to use for eating the tusks are different so the tusks you want to see want to use me that word but i didn't want to do that so teeth so dikhan is something else so whatever you are showing to the whole world is not really true and as students of linguistics and uh, educated people worried about india we must be a little more careful now the second question is does multilingualism lead to language and endangerment no it's because now see we have uh, survived or all our minor minor languages have survived for so long even if we have been multilingual the uh, uh, example i have given you is gompers and wilson study where all of them speak various languages but the, all the languages have been uh, maintained so indicate and have it to that the principle so let's follow that kind of principle and see that the situation improves and uh, if you um, today uh, in the morning uh, nicolas uh, osler was giving some other um, um, reasons for uh, multilingualism you know uh, he was giving uh, giving those um, um, points but many of you may not worry but i should worry bilingualism delays dementia so dementia is a disease which you know bilingualism Uh, delays and in fact you know ellen bialystock if you do language teaching you, you must be familiar with her name she has conducted a study at the, for on on the advent of dementia in um, america and her findings are that the monolingual americans who speak only english have uh, are affected by dementia at the age of 71 point something i'm ignoring that and the bilingual americans are affected by dementia at the age of 75 which means if you know more languages you can live a healthy life for at least 4 years so everything will be done so with this kind of comments i hope the younger people will definitely try to be multilingual and i am a multilingual person and for of uh, for most of you let me tell you that when i went to school i had to study sanskrit because there is no option for hindi that's how i know sanskrit but i have learned hindi and my hindi is fairly good and it will be certified by no less a person than professor india sasni thank you very much any questions yes sir yeah yes uh, uh, so you have uh, given out the census data for example i take uh, hindi because that's more uh, prominent example here uh, for example uh, when you say that a hindi speaker is not a multilingual Okay, I think you are making essentially a contradictory statement when Hindi encompasses more than fifty six. Forty nine. Forty nine. Yeah, okay. Yeah. One and one of them is Hindi. And one of them. And one of them is Hindi. Okay. Right. Others. Others is also included. There is also another category there. There is also another category which I don't know what it is. Uh, as per the census, but forty nine plus others and one of them is Hindi. Let's, for example, take a speaker uh, somewhere from Bihar who is probably a Magi speaker from the Patna region. would know magi very well at home would speak magi very well would also know hindi and would have also if gone to school know some level of english right but i unfortunately have a census would club magi along with hindi so basically our bilingualism is rooted out here right we have just cut it out we have we are denying that there is a bilingualism and multilingualism existing in this case and again second uh, this is a language and dialect debate that is Very prominent. I understand. Yeah, my play and Hindi. There are many things that people can go on pointing out. So, in that sense, I would say bilingualism may be the rarity. I agree with you. I agree with you on that. Bilingualism, I won't necessarily say for people coming from Hindi. Hindi, but if we consider Magi, Bajika, Bajika, I can keep on going on the name. So, I'm sure you also know. We are all seeing. So, do we consider them or we just don't? We just go with the what the state says. Uh, I 
fully understand whatever you are saying. Yeah. But in you need, when something is serious, you need to give a shock treatment. A shock treatment is required. Now, I know that Bhojpuri is not a dialect of Hindi. Is there any Bhojpuri speaker here? Yeah. The day I heard Bhojpuriya, I was delighted that day. <laughs> And I am sure the audience will be delighted to who are sitting there. God means pay, dharliya pakadliya. In Odia it is God or dhari nela, dhari pakela, whatever it is. Now, the future marker in Bhojpuri is Ba. Will you go? Say that. Parmashma. Jayab. And um, 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 past tense marker is La. And uh, ask any Bengali or Odia speaker, they will say that, oh, Mujibi, Mugali, see, Ba and La. Now, linguistically, uh, I mean, grammatically, lexically, it should be close to Assamese, Bengali, Hindi, etc., etc. Uh, sorry, Odia, etc., not Hindi. But somehow, it's, it's a better politics. So, th this is not something which we are going to discuss. But I'm, what I'm doing, I understand all those things very well. But I'm taking the census data. And trying to give a picture, no, sometimes we will have to do a little bit of, uh, what should I say, um, um, polit academic politics also. Let's do that. Now, if people are doing it, let's tell them that, well, this is what is happening. And it, it, certain things for a good uh, purpose should be done and can be done. And we must champion the cause of bilingualism, multilingualism. Otherwise, why did I tell you that, um, you know, why did I bring that um, uh, news uh, to tell you that, you know, bilingualism delays dementia? No, it is a Western concept. Now, in multilingualism, uh, suppose somebody says that, oh, it delays forever, something like that. It is more exciting for people who become old and, uh, you know, uh, that kind. That's, that's the part of this. One more. Yes. So the point uh, I believe that you are making that we should make an academic politics is in reference to the failed model of a free language format, right? Yes. Okay. So in this context, again, the trilingual figures, as we move along the table from scheduled towards non scheduled we see that the trilingual figures also keep on increasing, and the bilingualism figure also. So now that's a very telltale sign of the of one thing I would call as failure of the trilingual, uh, the free language formula, because where there is no free language formula being implemented, these people are already Trilingual or bilingual, but where there are trilingual form, three language forms are implemented, we are not actually this big in multilingual or bilingual speakers, right? Because the very the very fact yeah, that I understand that. Huh? Uh, yeah, I understand that. If some of you may be uh, may not uh, um, be aware of the fact that three institutes were in charge for implementing the three language formula in this country, and thousands of crores of money have been spent. Central Institute of Indian Languages for promoting mother tongues. Central Institute of Hindi, Kendra Hindi Sansthan to promote Hindi. And Central Institute of English, not English and foreign languages to start with, to promote English. So this was the um, case. But now see, the situation, three institutes were in charge. But nothing, things have happened. Now we must analyze where things have gone wrong why things have gone wrong. So that is the way. Unless we analyze, then nothing can be done. I, I would rather say how things are working when there is no regulation in the non general groups. Uh, because the functional multilingualism seems to be very robust. I would say that because I own my experience and uh, coming from a Tamil speaking background, to be very clear, we don't have a three language formula. I know two language formula. Yeah, two language yes. formula seems to be working for us and then I am sure no. More, more, more uh, 2011 census would have more data on that. No, it's okay. No, two language formula shouldn't work for anybody. If it worked for Tamil, it should work for Odisha, it, it should work for, you know, Andhra Pradesh also. And uh, look, I um, deal with students from various states in uh, uh, our university. Most of them can read, write Hindi, cannot speak well at all, understand a little better. And uh, if you talk about English, mashallah, what can I say, tell you. English also equally problematic, and except those who come from the so-called English medium schools, and their spoken English is much better. But when it comes to writing, 
Again, there are many problems, not one, many problems. If you want, I can show you the answer. I have evidence from their answer scripts also. So all these things are happening. Yeah? So I have a couple of observations to yeah. make. Uh, you have, you, first of all, I'll congratulate you for the wonderful talk. So I was in the US for the last 15 years. And uh, in most of the universities, if not all, they have a foreign language requirement for the PS2. So if a person from Chinese background, they know Chinese, they come to the US, which they already know English, and they are learning a foreign language, like for example, Hindi. So the point we are saying, like the monolingual world, bilingual, they have realized the importance of the multilingual world, driving world, and now most of the universities have this phenomenon that uh, they introduce and every lab, every student, every person has to learn a foreign language. In that case, maybe some of them are bilingual, but most of them have become trilingual, or what we call multilingual. So in US, the situation is getting changed also. And to support, they have also started a very late, very late language program. Yeah, those things I know. Yes. Even in fact, Dr. Jangir Varsi was teaching a teaching heritage language there. Yes. So these things I know. Now, if, look, um, it was only a month ago, probably, uh, there was a big news item in Times of India that in the English and Foreign Languages University, I may have that cutting uh, uh, in the guest house, uh, foreign languages uh, are not attractive, hardly any student is taking admission in the foreign language courses. So, English and Foreign Languages University, remember, now, what I'm trying to say is that here we will have to discuss why things are not happening. What are the problems? That's what I'm saying. If there is some this language policy, let's say, that some kind of discussion, debate all over the country, it becomes quite meaningful, useful, all of us can participate. And foreign languages, look, America is a very different country. There people pay a lot of money in order to learn a language. Here it's all free. And uh, a, um, a mother tongue teacher, let's say a person who teaches Odia need not have any training in Odia. And when that person is on leave, the mathematics, science, any teacher will be asked, can you go and take the class? Such things are happening. That's why I made a statement that most of our grammars are not grammars of our languages. I'll give an example. I'm sure some of you may have a doubt. Um, uh, I have, my students have heard that. Uh, how many, um, is there a Bengal speaker here? Uh, uh, how many uh, uh, numbers in Bengali? Two. What are those? Singular. Okay. Say, um, I go. Ami jabo. Uh, no, I will go, you are saying. Ami jabo. No, it's okay. Ami jabo. It's okay. I will go. We will go? Amra Okay. Ami jai, Amra jai. Okay. What is the difference in the verb? I go. You say, okay. Um, um, no, better. I uh, no, I am here. Say that. That's better. This is for others to understand. I am here. Ami ekhane achi, amra ekhane achi. See, ami ekhane, I here achi, am, amra we ekhane achi. So he is saying, I am here, we am here. That's what he is saying. He is not saying we are here. But all the grammar books say that there are two numbers in Bengali, singular and plural. What is the plural? So that's what I am saying. We must be little sensitive and sensitize our students. That's the reason for which our students are not learning grammars. They are not memorizing the grammars in order to pass the exams. And they cannot link, connect their mother tongue to the grammars. As a result, all these things are happening. So that's the probably I will respond to your uh, statement or comment. Sir, the second thing, second point is like uh, I belong to the art, uh, not the art. And four or five districts, the Muslim population, those who are not literate, they speak a language. If I go back to my village, the language I will be speaking, for example, whatever is the body or it has no script. But if you ask me what language you are speaking with your friend in the village or with your parents or with your relatives, I have no name. Okay. So that language has a modern tradition. Uh, recently, uh, being a linguist, like uh, I wrote a grammar for that, it was published from Germany. 
but it has no written record until now, I think. Should be, and uh, so it is still a dialect, and there was a problem with the name also. The people, original people, Matthew speaking people were very much against me because I named that in Islam Urdu. So my argument was like, uh, because it is spoken only by the indigenous Muslim people in those villages, so I named it and some of the vocabulary that related to. So these are kind of situations. So in endangered language, coming back to your morning observations, so are we talking about the only language or that is also included, like dialect is also included in that or Bodhi is also included? So, um, um, Dr. Jahangir Varsi, Muhammad Jahangir Varsi, in the morning I also made a statement that if somebody is saying that your language is a dialect, I am practicing linguistic unteachable. I said that. I, I and I very strongly believe in it. For me, every language that is spoken is a language. And then what is dialect or not, that will be discussed because it's a different issue. And uh, whatever you were talking, referring to the grammar, I'll comment on that only if I, you present me a copy of that grammar. I will So, otherwise I don't know anything. So, uh, in a lighter way, I will comment on that only after I get a copy of that, not before. Yes. No, I agree whatever he is saying. No, we don't have languages. And sometimes if the uh, census enumerator asks me, what language do you speak? Aligadiya. <laughs> and such, oh, many such Kishan Ganjiya and all sorts of things, they are there. Oh, of course, such, such answers have been given. And the linguists sitting in the language division, they rationalize that, well, Aligadiya cannot be, because maybe 50, 100, 20 people, 200 people must have given it as. I'll give you another very nice example. Dakni is not a mother tongue till today. Dakni is not a mother tongue till today according to the census. When it is very different from Urdu. It's not Urdu. Grammatically it's Telugu. Lexically it's Hindi Urdu, whatever you call it. But they never claim it to be a mother tongue. Now we are trying to Convince them that Dakini is a mother tongue who claim it to be a mother tongue now, probably it will happen. Yes. Yeah, you were asking. So, uh, suppose uh, uh, if I am a speaker of three languages, will I be called as a multilingual? No, why semi speaker? Why should you uh, take pride in saying that you are a semi No, don't say that. No, we um, must try to, uh, one, uh, probably, I don't know, can I take a couple of minutes? Look, we always go by our prejudices, assumptions. Um, a child acquires the mother tongue reasonably well within two years. Around the twelfth month, the child speaks the first word, plus minus two and two and a half months. By three years, the child is almost a normal speaker of the language, can communicate easily. And not only one language, if the child is, ex the father speaks one language, the mother speaks another language, or the home language is one language and the outside language is one language, the child picks up both the languages very well. And you can refer to Leopold's study of uh, uh, his two daughters, Hildegard and Karla, and the four volumes that he has published, which are, uh, I don't know, you know, they must be, uh, Leopold must be given equal credit as uh, uh, Piaget, the same kind of study he has done. Because um, uh, Leopold used to, or uh, um, he and his wife used to speak German at home, so uh, both the girls were exposed to German at home and, uh, you know, English outside. And when they went to Germany, uh, Hildegard picked up German very well, uh, German very well, and they uh, went back to America, again, you know, she um, 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 forgot German and started speaking English. But uh, the second girl, um, uh, Carla, uh, she was um, she was a passive bilingual. She knew um, very well uh, English, but no German, but she was not speaking. And when, um, at the age of 19, she went to Germany and became almost a fluent speaker of German. So if you have good exposure, so that will be very useful. Why should you say semi-speaker of such a language? No, there, there is no point. Let's say that to such. You see, nobody has defined bilingualism quantitatively. There are maximalist definitions and minimalist definitions kind of thing. If you look at uh, Bloomfield to whatever other people, 
you will see that the kind of difference. So let's not get into that. If you acquire some language relatively well and use it, that's perfectly all right. The concept of classical language is all about politics. Yes. Uh, I just thought something, making it somewhere, somewhere, just got some imagination. So now I'll say some statement, imagine the politics. I'll say some statement. Okay. Uh, you also quoted that most of the rice eating states in India. No, I quoted him, who is sitting here. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> at the beginning, before, even before. Uh, yeah. Most of the rice eating states in India are uh, more concerned about their. Uh, Language. So, I was quoting him. <laughs> yeah, tell me. Okay, try linking this one with politics, with current uh, political scenario. So you come to know the reality. Uh, no. Uh, so look, uh, uh, here the situation is he is making an observation based on data. Uh, classical language, look, whether government of India says that or not, Sanskrit and Tamil are classical languages. Now, after that, the policy started. In fact, um, I shouldn't make, because um, uh, the whole thing is being recorded, I shouldn't say certain things. But, you know, whether somebody says or not, Sanskrit, Tamil, Pali, and Prakrit, they are classical languages. And they have been treated as classical languages for centuries by scholars. Now, you know, people, as if something becomes a classical language, some kind of benefits are there. So these things are politics, not that, you know, most of the rising states are being ruled by non. No, I, I don't, these are no. No, look, look. Here, uh, that is something which you forget. Certain things you look in India, you must be tolerant, you must appreciate plurality, you must, uh, you know, not object if sambar and rasam are not served here because when people, these people go to your state, no, they no, also do that. Uh, that's the end. That's Okay, that's good. Yes, sir. Yes, Dr. Hasne. I think we're talking about the semi or even notions like incipient bilingualism. Okay. See, most of the problems that have come about have come about because uh, the way social linguistics has inherited the notion of authenticity. Yeah. from its precursor of dialectology and folk. That has been a very strong thing that did not allow social linguists to come out of it as a dissident per se. And every time there is always a notion of desire to go for the origin. Yes. This has been the practice of dialectologists. If you, if you look up the, the classical notion of printed projects, notion of norm, which is a, which is a norm as an yeah. acronym, it's again a desire for the authenticity. Yes. And, and all these things are coming because the authenticity notion has carried with it a notion of essentialism. Yes. Which is again contributing a lot to what we are talking about in terms of language being a language. Yeah. So when we talk about bilingualism, multilingualism, trilingualism in senses, we have a very compartmentalized notion that there is one plus one plus one plus one. And all these additive notions are the notions which do not really fit the brain that you and I have, which is a multilingual brain. Yes. So th these, these are certain conceptual problems that really we need to address as a social linguist also. <coughs> I want to ask you, uh, see when we're talking about uh, endangerment, since you talked about academic politics, these have academic politics very much associated with the notion of endangerment as much as it is associated with the notion of linguistic human rights. Yes. Yeah. Because <laughs> both of them have the same kind of a, a, a parallel discourse that is, that is very true. both of them. Very true. And we have not really come up with any kind of an assessment that when there is a loss of language, do the languages really get wiped out in the history and memory of the people? Or do they leave behind certain traces? Okay. Because the traces are also there. See, if we, if we recall, I mean, I, I just quote Nehru when he wrote in the Discovery of India, when he said that there is an aspect of palimpsest. The ancient India is a palimpsest. And when he talked about palimpsest, what he said that the civilization that has gone into the making of Indian history 
is a civilization which we never got wiped out. Well, layer after layer was there, which was all coming up, and that palimpsest notion really, very, 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 very cleverly, it really negates the notion of essentialism and brings into the heterogeneity of the civilization. I think we are getting more enamored when we talk about the loss, as if there is a loss of history, loss of memory, and then we start talking because there is no, I do not know, perhaps Nicholas or some of us who have been really involved in the issues of language endangerment, to see whether they, they still have those traces of the previous language. So the structural level, the traces ought to be seen. Last observation that yeah, I want to make here. Because I'm, I'm an old man, I forget very quickly. No, no, you don't have to answer. We'll take it up in the Don't worry about that. We'll take it up in the daytime. The last thing that I wanted to uh, the, uh, just make an observation is that when you're talking about the rootedness, yeah. I agree with you. There's a very strong rooted, root, notion of rootedness. But today with the ongoing debate of identity is there. In this debate of identity, speciality has lost its, its, its sheen. The speciality is not there anymore. And especially so, or more so, when there is a digitalized world. Because you have an imaginary community all over. So the, the sense of rootedness also gets diluted with the process. Other than that, I'm not expecting any comment from you, any reaction from you, because we'd like to have uh, uh, Nicholas, and then we can all take it up together. Because uh, you know, I will just refer sure. to um, a language, um, and uh, somebody is, who is sitting here is working on that language, which is extinct. Many. What is that language? Sonuval huh? Kachari. Sonuval Kachari. Well, because she comes from there, so Kasari. So it's Sonuval Kachari. Okay. And the chief minister of Assam is, he is Sonuval, remember that. So he is supposed to speak that language. And uh, that work has been assigned to her and she is trying very hard. That's very, you know, this is uh, uh, in the area of language reclamation, which we discussed, you know, I was referring to, you know, a seminar which you organized there, we discussed that, and Nazreen, you were also there when we talked about language reclamation. And uh, I'm, in fact, I've asked her to work it out, I hope, you know, something will be done in that area. So, that language, she has gone to the field three times, many days she has spent there, very difficult to find a speaker. Interestingly, their culture is very much intact. You know, they have separate dress, separate uh, yes, religious practices. Yes, those things we will have to find out. Then only come, because Bodo is a sister of uh, Sonwal Khajari. So we have to, once we get something, then only comparison and all these things can be done. So languages are lost. Yes, you want to ask them. I personally is very skeptical about this language thing and which language for those, which may go on policy and stuff like that. But if you look at it, uh, um, I mean, I feel they play a very little role in fomenting multilingualism. If you look at the Northeast, where actually Sri Lanka is not where that is, it's not in Nepal, it's not in none of the states actually. But the amount of multilingualism that you find in Assam or in Arunachal Pradesh, other languages, how would you say it? Where does, but uh, you know, in that case, I don't see actually these policies. Policies can also only make you literate in that language. Nazreen, since we are talking about Arunachal Pradesh, I'll ask you a question. Why Hindi is becoming the Lunga Franca in Arunachal? That, yeah, that can be a case, but See, no, no, the question has system. to be, no, the question has to be, no, the same thing. Why has Bihar accepted Hindi as the language? And why India, um, that's what I was uh, uh, mentioning to um, um, Professor Nicholas Vosler. Uh, India has accepted um, uh, those languages as lingua franca which were not the mother tongues of any group in this country. First it was Sanskrit, when Prakrit and Pali, Prakrit and Pali all these languages are spoken, they accepted Sanskrit, then became Persian, now English. You see, this is the tragedy of a multilingual state, multilingual country. And we always compete with each other. Now, if um, Hindi gets something, 
um, Bengali feels bad. If Bengali gets something, Tamil feels bad. So that kind of problem is there. So that must be the reason for which you know Bihar has accepted Hindi, even though it's not a Hindi-speaking state, technically speaking. Something similar is happening in Arunachal, etc., etc. So yes, Papuji, why are you asking questions here? Yes, sir. This is eighty-eight percent. And less than 10,000 are not included in this sense of India. Bapuji, Why the is this Bapuji, the problem is education is in the concurrent list. When it is the concurrent list, everybody's responsibility becomes nobody's responsibility. So, central government will say this is what the state should do. The state says that, well, this is what the center should do. So, as a result, all these problems. So these are issues which we should probably debate, think about, discuss, and finalize. But these 10,000 people are all there among this 98 percentage. Uh, this was done only after 1961. Before that, that was not there. In 1961, census all the languages, whether major, minor, whatever it is, mother tongues have been, uh, you know, uh, listed. Now only after that only 10,000 that. The rule was implemented, okay, and that was implemented. Also, there was a reason. You must know that 1950 to 1965, these 15 years were given to promote Hindi as the national language. So all these things were there at the background, and uh, I won't like to discuss those things. Here. This last question, sir. Yes. 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 Thank you for the session, sir. Uh, before I just talk to you, I mean, ask you a question. I would like to ask a question to the entire audience. I just find it open. Please do that. That's better. Right? I prefer that. Make when I'm coming back to you, sir. Everyone, I just want to ask you how many of you are speaking an endangered language which is listed or either it's not listed but you consider it endangered? Can you please raise your hand? So, if you. Are you aware of it that your language. I mean, okay, so not, no one else except me. Are you raising your hand? Yeah, You're raising a hand. Okay, great. Okay, she's raising her hand. What are you? Okay. So this is four of us. One, two, three, four. What's your what's the name of your language which is in uh, No, the language you was talking about it has no name. You don't speak at home. I come from Bihar. Okay. The region from this was talking. And it's in danger in the sense it has no place. It is endangered because it has no name. Okay. So I don't know, sorry, I'm not sure. Okay. Now the language that I speak. It's uh, called Ranglo, it's in Uttarakhand and it's listed because there are three varieties. In fact, in Wikipedia, endangered language section, it is listed as Byangho, Bamba and Dharma. Next to me, she is also sitting, she is also speaking the same language and the interesting part for all of you might be that we are from two different countries. I'm from India, she's from Nepal because the river divides us and the government of India and Nepal over a cup of tea might have decided to just divide us on the basis of the river. She is from Northeast, so her language, what's your language? Mali. What? Mali. Mali, okay. So anyway, so my question is, come, uh, what I want to talk to sir about is, government is spending crores, maybe more or less, whatever, and they're spending money on documenting the language, which is good. I think over a period of time, when we lose these languages and all. But what I want to know, sir, is what are they doing for the preservation of the language and passing on the language to the current generation? Number two, the indigenous, the tribal, whatever you want to call those uh, children, was they, these languages generally don't have a script. We don't have a script. That's number one reason why people who are not even born and raised in that area, forget about India, a lot of children are now growing up in other countries. I was one of them during my time. So we don't have people speaking and we don't have anything to uh, read. We don't have any text. For example, Malayalis, Tamilians, anybody who is born outside Kerala, they will have a script, they will be able to practice and everything, they will be able to learn their language. Third thing, the government, uh, it talks about wanting to preserve our language if they are thinking of that. Then how come when uh, in the last two years, my daughter's school has constantly asked us to fill the form and ask, are we speaking any, what are our languages and everything, we are filling it up. They say it's for the government. If the government is keeping a note of all these languages, what are they doing to check ki, okay, this child is from an endangered language uh, speaking community. So my daughter, whether she knows Ranglo or not, the government doesn't bother. But English, Hindi, plus a foreign language, Spanish, that she has to take, 
So if suppose she was wanting to learn Ranrosa, then how would she be learning four languages at one time? Would she be able to say that, sorry, I, I can't learn Spanish right now because I have the pressure of learning A, B and C. So these are the kind of things. So if you could just kind of throw some light on this. Because this is the actual problem of how our languages are endangered, languages are dying. Because there is, if, if my generation yeah, of people are not able to pass on, sir, it's things. gone. No, a couple of things. Uh, when you say your language doesn't have a script in the morning, I mentioned that Urdu yes. doesn't have a script. Yes. Hindi doesn't have a script. English doesn't have a script. Yeah. And we have been writing, or I know many endangered language speakers who have been writing their languages in one script. They have been doing that. There is no harm. If Bodo can be written in Devanagari, Mizo or Khasi can be written in Roman. So why not? What's the problem here? Yes. So the, uh, what, that's very interesting. That's one thing because I thought that question I would talk about in the orthography section. So when you're talking about Bodo is written in that, the people who made those scripts, were they somebody, I mean, was it the community or what? Because my community, exactly what you're saying, we don't have a script. But because of everybody, the young generation, when they, the ones who know the language, they're actually using the Roman script. But they're having problem because all the sounds are not coming in that. The senior people, they've started using the Devnagri script. So I completely agree with what you're saying. But sir, there's certain mark, you know, the markers which are missing. So do we come to, who do we go to to say that, okay, we want this to be done officially? Uh, look at that, can I? Yes, yeah. probably we should yeah, take it up yeah. when, when Nicholas takes up this lecture. Yeah. Okay. Yes. But then you can react to that over a cup of tea. Yeah. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I just thought I want to be able to say what I could say in French, but I can't say it in English and I can't say it in English. So it's bonjour. Uh, hello again. Um, we are diverging from the official script here and having the last, what would have been the last lecture um, here on the first day, because basically I shan't be here at the time when I would have been um, scheduled to deliver this. Um, so what this, um, this paper as it is on, on the, um, the PowerPoint, we can uh, re repeat some things I said this morning, so we won't need to say that again, now, so we can speed things up. But it is about basically um, the evolving consciousness of foreign languages and how to teach them, how to learn them, which is something which is, was not obvious and has, has grown essentially over the last, really the last 400 years. So I, um, I, I call this thing the wonder of foreign languages, why are they still here? In some sense, one wonders if it is so obviously beneficial for world communication that there should only be one language, why do we still have thousands of them? Um, partly because people have gone on um, trying to learn um, and even um, encouraging other people to learn. So this was what we were going to say about the human colonization of the earth, we had all this. And uh, summing up in the fact of the axial age, which um, was the last part of the, of the last millennium, sorry, of the, of the, the second to last millennium, um, so over 2,000 years ago, uh, through the spread of writing, empires, languages, and world faith, we got the world divided up into, um, in a sort of hegemonist way. So there were major leading languages, leading religions, leading empires, which um, defined people's idea of what diversity there was in the world. And I, I, I sort of sum it up with this slogan that by 1900, when there were European empires um, all over um, the world, actually, outside Europe, um, that something had happened in that um, Previously to, say, 1900, um, you could live somewhere in the world but not be attached effectively to the world human community. But after 1900, basically, your address was available to anyone. People would come and contact you for whatever reason. The whole world had somehow been mapped 
and it was a finite space rather than an open-ended frontier. And uh, uh, as an example of that sort of process of definition and what it meant for indented languages, I thought we could take the example of the continent of Europe, which was defined as a continent, I suppose, by the Greeks. Um, and this is what we understand about the language situation in Europe in 500 BC. So, two and a half thousand years ago, uh, there were many, many more languages in Europe um, than there certainly were a thousand years later at the end of the Roman Empire. And the um, languages which there were in Europe were more diverse genetically than the languages of Europe are today. So you can see uh, Gaulish, which is a language which doesn't exist at all anymore, was the, the most um, dominant and widespread language in the continent, in terms of area at least. And it closely related British was there, less closely related but also another Celtic language, Irish, in Ireland. Um, there were other Celtic languages, at least um, um, two um, other Celtic languages in um, Spain, but there were other less uh, closely related Indo-European languages, like Lusitanian, um, and we don't really know very much about what sort of languages Tartessian, um, spoken in the south, or Iberian in the east were. Aquitanian has survived as Basque, and even in... Um, and in Italy, which we tend to think of as the domain for Latin, but it wasn't. In 500 BC, um, at the time of the Persian War, say, there were um, at least um, six or seven different major languages in the Italian peninsula. And then going further, further to the east, you've got um, four languages, Getic or Dacian, Illyrian, Thracian, Macedonian, spoken in what is now the Balkans. Greek was, was the dominant language in Greece, as it still is, um, but broken up into a lot of different dialects, something we'll talk about in another lecture. And uh, there were more um, languages, at least four or five languages, in um, Asia Minor, what is now Turkey. And although we don't know the, the continent of Africa, we don't know a great deal about what was spoken there. It, it would appear that Libyan was widespread, and um, also a spreading of the uh, Phoenician language, which is very, very close to Hebrew, um, was spoken in what is now Tunisia, um, what was then Carthago. So you can see, I mean, if, you, if you add, add, add up um, the languages, there were um, over 30 languages spoken in Europe as a whole at that time. You see what happened largely as a result of the Roman conquest of most of that space is what the situation was um, a thousand years later in 500 AD. And all the, um, the horizontal lines on this map represent areas where Latin was used. It was often used in a, in a mixture with other languages or um, as, a, as an overlay language, a super straight perhaps, in many cases especially in Spain um, and in uh, eastern France as it came. Um, there had very recently been a spread of Germanic languages with uh, Germanic tribes coming across the Rhine and establishing kingdoms all over Western Europe where so that, now that shows that basically the Roman Empire had ceased to be an effective military police force for the whole of Europe. Um, so the, the, um, the Germanic people um, came in and brought their languages with them. Um, it didn't last very long in Germanic languages, but it did find that they were still wide, widespread across Europe. Um, and you can see that they were also widespread across Italy as well. Has all the way through there. Um, but the, uh, the, the crucial point is that now there was a 
Latin was an effective lingua franca for um, most of the continent. And it was, as we know from the development of the Romance language, it was going to replace a number, or in fact most, of the vernacular languages of Europe. Um, the Greek was going to hang on a little bit longer in the East. So we, we get into a situation subsequent to um, 500 AD, say in 550, where there were the Mediterranean Sea was uh, a lake of, of two lingua francas, a Greek in the east and, wrote, and Latin in the west. And as we know, the, uh, it turned out that the Greek was going to um, survive, um, both politically and linguistically, um, for considerably longer in the Mediterranean. Um, why did this happen? Well, part of the reason was the enthusiasm of the um, sub subjects of the Roman Empire for humanitas, is the, the, <coughs> the Latin word for civilization, rather than humanity. So when you um, get properly civilized, you'd be a, a, a real human being, a real homo. And part of the tokens for doing that was accepting Latin, and indeed accepting higher features of Latin culture. Tacitus remarks that um, in Germany and in Britain, in his, in, in his time, which was effectively um, at the end of the first century AD, um, the elites of the, of the conquered societies it, it accepted Roman culture with alacrity, and he says that although it was really just a sign of their own slavery, they nevertheless um, were very pleased to accept it all. And you can see a Roman uh, clad in the toga on the right-hand side here. This was a sign of it. And this is how, well, how you dress if you wanted to speak Latin the best way you could but in, a, in, a, in a legal speech or something like that. So, so it was very much a linguistically dominating culture. But it was one which didn't really tolerate uh, diversity. Um, to the extent that, um, that we do know people were actively trying to learn Greek if they already spoke Latin, or Latin if they spoke Greek. And we have some early uh, Latin um, textbooks here. Um, which actually were by the sort of direct method um, how, you, how you express yourself in extreme situations here. So this is how you got into a fight and a quarrel in Latin in the first, second century AD. Um, so the same text is in, here in, in Greek and in Latin. And we don't know whether it was the Greeks to learn Latin or the Latin speakers to learn Greek. But the text is, is a beast fighter giving me abuse? Let me know. I'll knock his teeth out. I'll have your eyes out. I know your little game. I'll have you thrown in jail for life. You're calling me out, you jailbird. I'm not following with you. You've got your friends, but you'll find I've got one too. And so these are the sort of um, artful ways of provoking people um, in Latin or Greek. And so it shows that there were, it wasn't uh, a serene language by any means. It was. Um, everything. Um, well, it was accepted as the uh, ultimate symbol of civilization uh, in Europe, and it remained so for at least another thousand years. That's a long time, you know. That's at least 30, 35 generations. People went on using Latin, and it was the science that they naturally thought this would be eternal. There was, not, there was no change in that period, from 500 AD to 1500 AD. People went on thinking that Latin was the absolute uh, symbol of, of culture. And, and culture often had to be, um, was, was resisted by wild children, so they needed to be corrected. And you can see this is the symbol of Grammatica, Dame Grammatica. Um, she has a book in one hand, and she has a whip in the other for 
punishing school children. You can see her doing the same thing on the right hand side, and some of the children are not enjoying it very much. Um, so uh, and that was the way a real language was going to be taught. Other languages, presumably, people picked up and there were bilinguals in this area, but there was no theorization of how that process worked. The only language which was theorized, well, there were two languages theorized. There was Greek, which had worked out its own grammar, um, and there was Latin, where it turned out that Greek Latin, uh, Greek grammar fitted pretty well, and so they had made it part of the task of learning Latin, and they used the same textbooks for these ten, uh, ten centuries, um, just as they were learning ten. So it was very effective in keeping the language absolutely stopped. There was no language change in terms of grammatica. The, and so the grammatica non fit, nisi per terbulam, is a little map matcher and is saying that you do not get gra grammar unless you use a whip, a ferula, in order to make people learn it. Um, well, that's the way things were for, as I say, a thousand years. And then, interestingly enough, just about the time that the uh, Europeans were discovering that they were not alone in the world, there was a whole new continent um, out to the west. Um, uh, when the, the people like Christopher Columbus were going exploring westward. Um, there was an interesting um, Spaniard called Antonio de Nebrija, who had studied actually in Italy, and became aware that in principle, any language would have a grammar, not just Latin and Greek. And in fact, um, if you aspired to create your own empire, as the Spanish were doing at that time, they ought to do something similar for their language that the Romans did for Latin. And so we start, we get the first Grammatica de la Lengua Castellana. At the end of the 15th century, it was presented by uh, Antonio Nebrija to <coughs> Queen Isabel, the, the, the Queen of Spain, at exactly the same time that she was funding the expedition of Christopher Columbus to cross the Atlantic. It's an amazing coincidence. And he said, if we're going to have an empire, at that stage, Spain, Spain, if Spain had an empire, it was all in Iberia, maybe a couple of dots in, in Africa. But what we think of as a Spanish empire, nobody it was a fantasy at that stage. No Spaniard had ever been to South America or Central America. Nevertheless, this, this incredibly President man Antonio Nebrica said, when you are building the Spanish Empire, you will need to teach people Spanish. Here's how you will do it. And he provided a, 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 um, a grammar of, um, of Spanish, or Castilian as he would call it, because it came from the north of Spain, um, on exactly the same terms as people were familiar uh, with the, the grammar books of Latin, and to a lesser extent of, of Spanish. Of, of, of Greek and possibly Hebrew, but mostly they knew Latin. So um, he was asked by Queen Isabel, who was sort of sympathetic to his ideas, but uh, people were thinking about these things for the first time. Well, why would anybody want to learn Spanish? I already know Spanish. I don't need a grammar book, do I? And he said, "Well, there are three classes of men." who might benefit from the Grammatica de la Lingua Castellana. Um, and he sets that out in the fifth book. Those speak, seeking a rational understanding of Spanish, those wishing to learn Latin by learning the concept as applies to Spanish. So it was quite, thinking that Latin was actually quite an alien language, you might understand better if you first saw the principles applied within your own language, then you could learn Latin better. And furthermore, there was a third category, people outside who had nothing to do with Spanish at all, but might want to learn it anyway. Mm. And so here it is. This, this is um, how it's organized. It's organized li li like a, a, a contemporary uh, grammar of Latin, which is pretty familiar to those of us who have actually learned Latin even in the 20th century, or in your case, I suppose, mostly in the 21st century. Um, now, um, so that, that happened, and uh, there were grammars of um, Spanish taken out to the Caribbean. Um, there were many of the natives wishing to learn 
Spanish because unfortunately most of them died before they got a chance to incorporate themselves into the Spanish system um, that their empire as it was emerging. Um, nevertheless, um, the idea that every, every major state should have its own language and furthermore that language should be um, analyzed in a, in a grammar book did catch on. So in Europe, we see um, the symbolic dignity of nations um, summed up in grammars. In the Americas, uh, the mission of the church required um, Jesuits and other um, monks who were learning the um, foreign languages in order to use them to spread the, the faith. This was, this was a new uh, concept um, which perhaps had eluded their breakup, but it was very, very important. And Nahuatl and Quechua and all the major lingua francas of the Americas were very soon analyzed in Latin style grammars. People said that they, they, were too, they used Latin grammar too much, but in fact they were, they were quite sophisticated in, in seeing new concepts that they needed. And so you find grammar books for European languages all over, from English and German and Polish and uh, Welsh. All sorts of these uh, languages were um, given their grammar books in the 16th, 17th centuries. Then in the, that was the, uh, the motive during the early years of the Spanish Empire. Then the other European countries began to get organized to uh, look for empires of their own. And they were much more interested directly in worldwide trade. So that you start to get, um, um, but they, they began to discover that outside uh, Europe there were other languages which were sometimes could be used widely. Persian was one such language, Malay was another, another such language. Um, and so they would try to learn these languages in order to um, establish themselves in their trading missions. Um, and this was the origin of the phrase book, which we shall see a few a couple examples in a minute. Um, then, while after the, the trade, the early trading states, particularly the Portuguese Empire, had established itself, further European nations came on and actually tried to dominate places and change um, trade and commerce into dominion. And that's certainly, as you know from your own experience of, of my ancestors' um, visits to your land. Um, so in, at this point, we want we started to want to learn languages in order to establish empires, local languages of administration and the military. Um, and when the um, the empires were established, but usually they incorporated the smaller states, and the people who ran those smaller states, such as Rajas, Maharajas around here, um, would want to get access to. Um, the, the dominating power, is, who it might be English or French, through learning their languages. That's another reason for wanting to learn languages. And so here we see the mission of the church as it's expressed in a language in the arte. They used the, the Spanish like used like to use the word arte for grammar um, for reasons having to do with early books in the um, technical books in the Roman Empire. So arte y vocabulario de la lengua guaraní, that is the language which is still spoken to this day in Paraguay. And here you know, it's, it's being summed up in a grammar book. Um, have we got the date on it? I don't think we've got one. Anyway, it's in, it's in the 17th century, so about 1650. Um, here's another one of the trade phrase books. This is for um, people who speak English and want to learn Malayan. Um, and so you have a nice things like, what meaneth it, I pray you, that a certain elephant goeth covered with red cloth, before which drummers and trumpeters got? Sir, the, em the elephant which you see, and the man who sitteth in the little house set upon him, are a token that they bring their king's letters unto our king. But who has those letters? That man who sitteth upon the elephant. When, who is it that sitteth upon him? It is one of the king's nobility chosen by him for this purpose. 
And it was another world, but anyway, it's been expressed in techniques which are now very, very familiar. Uh, of, um, you know, the rough guide to India, I have, you know, you know Indian wood group. It's in, very much in the same tradition, but it's not so um, engagingly different in terms of the world it, it shows us. Um, here's another one. Um, this is a, um, a British conversational manual, manual uh, collection of useful phrases in English, Hindustani, Persian, and Pashto. So you've got four for the price of one. Uh, you know, assuming you're going to go on to say the same sort of thing. So have you seen any men going that direction? Were they walking or riding? And you've got the same thing in Persian. Shumakuda Marumam Ba and Sulurao and Hidati. Shantiadam Yurapan Jao Tawa. And in Pashtu as well, I won't break it out since I have no knowledge in Pashtu. But they're trying to say things. So this was by Captain G. G. Plunk Plunkett uh, for use in the uh, British civil service and army here in India. And um, in fact, what, since the British in those days were good at turning everything into some form of commercial activity. Uh, they succeeded with language learning too. You had the English language teaching industry. The industry of foreign language teaching, which has equally supported and benefited from this phenomenon, took its origin from the hawking of England at the beginning of the 19th century, when mushroom schools grew up in Calcutta and all the centres of British power. The teachers were then nothing like the graduates in temples, but the broken down soldier the bankrupt merchant and the ruined spectator. So if you try, you try to have a, a career in something else, but if that didn't work, you threw, you, you decided to become an English teacher. <laughs> Along with one Mrs. Middleton of Dinapur, and even the celebrated Baptist missionary, William Carey, who wrote about those people in his 1882 member, memoir, The Good Old Days of Honorable John Company. In fact, the, John Company, the was doing its best to discourage foreigners from coming out to India um, and getting involved because they knew it was likely to create trouble in the long run, which it did. Um, this tour stuff leading up to 1857. Right, so everybody nowadays does know your address, um, and that means that this, what was good enough for just um, languages which had some linked with empire is now good for everyone. Um, and the result is that we have a, a world where a number of major languages have become established um, as wider scale lingua francas. I'm going to talk about them on other occasions, so we won't talk too much about them there, but you can see English is obviously a big one. Um, it's interesting this map sees the, 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 the the rich of English is not, um, does not run within India because that's been reserved to Hindi. So they can be speaking to you in Hindi now. Um, but anyway, there are a relatively small number of these major languages. Um, it's difficult for them to become global lingua francas in the way that English seems to have done because every one of them um, is regionally restricted. So Russian looks absolutely massive, and indeed it is in terms of, of area, but it is confined to um, Russia and its neighboring states. Um, ditto with, with Arabic, say, although it's spoken very widely in, in North Africa. It is just North Africa and um, Arabia where it's going to be used. English itself. Um, <coughs> Well, has become an, as we mentioned, it's an industry. Also, the analysis of English is an, another industry here because you talk about uh, at least three cycle, circles of English. Uh, one where it's spoken natively, a second one where it's an official language but it's not generally spoken, and the third status, which is probably the largest in the world, where it is the first foreign language where everybody learns it at school, and that's the key to its uh, useful utility now. As a, a world lingua franca. So the European Union, China, Japan, and Russia all accept English in this way that every, every child 
learns English at school. And here we see the, uh, effectively, the, the, the places where it's spoken natively are in dark yellow, the ones where it's an official language, um, but not uh, used at every level, um, are <coughs> in light yellow, and the rest of the world is learning English as a third language, goes to other countries in blue. Um, and there are just some points here, I mean, what this uh, slide is intended to show is just a strange phenomena which happened in the last few years, which showed that English has passed some sort of uh, tipping point. So all Chinese children, since I think 2002, study English at school. In Chinese negotiations with Sudan or Angola, the only available common language is English. So there's got nothing to do with China, and it's got nothing to do with Sudan or Angola. Nevertheless, they find themselves talking to each other in English, simply because it's the language they all learn at school. In France, 24, which by and large is the great enemy of English worldwide, um, nevertheless uh, has um, been prepared since 2006 to broadcast in English as well as in French. And um, David Gradle points out that more than 30% of Europeans have English as a second language, 55% um, know some, some English. Um, in 20 years, the number of English speakers in China is likely to exceed the number of English speakers as a first language in the rest of the world. That was the statement of our Prime Minister George Gordon Brown in 2005. Well, I don't know if we told him to say that, but is not normally one of his things. Um, but anyway, it seems um, conventional wisdom um, about 10 years ago. It may be that English in some shape or form will find itself in the service of world community community forever. This is the view of David Crystal in English as a global language, um, something that I've occasionally tweeted him with because he's does not actually prepared to, to defend this, but somebody had to say it, and luckily he did, so I can attack it. Um, and then the result, one of the things has been that language teaching itself has become theorized in a way that would have been unthinkable 100, year, 100 years ago or 150 years ago. Um, the traditional method, which was really um, pioneered by people like Nebrija and those um, the grammar um, the books that I talked about, is the grammar translation method, which um, has been actively developed from the 19th century. There are other measures which involve a lot of um, translation, the Japanese Yakudoku, the audio lingual method, which came out of Hot War, uh, which was applied to me when I was first learning German. Um, other um, <coughs> functional methods which um, somehow think that you will get the structure in instinctively so that you can use your basic should, um, approach should be through um, thinking of tasks to be discharged through languages, uh, the oral approach, the you know, situational language teaching, directed practice, but this it often means um, a lot of, of drill which puts people off and has not ultimately been um, very successful as a, a, a direct method of, of teaching. I mean, there are a number of interactive methods as well, um, which have been built up often quite weirdly. Um, there's one called the silent way, where you learn a language without actually saying anything, or rather the teacher says nothing, and the um, pupils say something until they get it right. <coughs> Natural approach, a total physical response, etc. There are various um, things, but th these are all things which have arisen effectively in the last half of the 20th century. But they are now being applied, these same methods, to bring back the languages which had been endangered. So here's an example, an interesting one. The Tupi Antigua language, the old Tupi language, is a, is a widespread lingua language which was spoken all around what is now Brazil before uh, the Portuguese ever came to Brazil. And um, it continued to be the major lingua franca of Brazil for two to three hundred years after the discovery of Brazil by the Portuguese in 1500. Um, and what um, Eduardo de Almeida Navarro has done has effectively written a, a primer similar to what um, we've just seen um, 
say, from Malay, people wanting to go to Malay to trade. Imagine if you were visiting 15th century Brazil. Uh, what would you need to learn to say? Well, he shows you how to do that. So, uh, and this is also, so, um, became uh, an indigenous language which, which survived for many years, but is now endangered in Brazil. And there's a, a possibility of, of getting it back again using these same methods, ironically, which were used for spreading Spanish and spreading English. Um, it, within uh, in England itself, there, is, well, there are a number of minority languages, one of them being Cornish. And here is uh, some examples of so like the separation from power in those societies. So uh, it's an interesting irony, as I said, that the, the, the methods which were originally developed, first of all to teach Latin and Greek thousands of years ago, and then all the major languages of civilizations and empires um, are now being used to, uh, to try and reinforce um, language, small languages from the past, which we may hope will continue to be languages in the future. Thank you very much. Certain uh, 
at the level of power to the potential customers for whom we're hoping to make, to make this money. Um, and at the same time, um, the, the local elites um, who had their own knowledge structures, which people perhaps were more um, were more uh, familiar with, nevertheless had the problem to solve for themselves. So why are we being dominated by them? Why aren't we doing what are we there must be something wrong with what we know and what we say. In the, and this was something which was certainly said in the, in the Roman Empire. How is it possible, people were saying in Britain, how is it possible that the Romans could dominate us when there are so few of them and there are so many of us, yet we cannot get ourselves organized in order to throw them out? There was, there was a, 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 a sort of, sort of it undermined people's self-confidence, the fact that empire had appeared to be successful. Then. So people had to learn. And, and, Now, the, the relationship between the different parts of the world is on, an all, as a, as on a more equitable basis, and we can directly learn from each other with, with mutual respect, in a way which doesn't come immediately in human society. At what stage did you read there was that transition from language to vernacular? When uh, people you mean um, in this time when they started saying, oh yes, every language has its own grammar, yeah. then they were effectively making vernaculars into languages. And then they started to worry about dialects and their obsession with dialects, which you still get to this day in media, when they ask you the dialects of different languages, um, must have started then, because there were, it, there were still we wanted to say that certain languages are worth analyzing theorizing and documenting, <laughs> whereas the rest is just vague, vagueness and it, it's, it's falling off from the norm. I mean, it, it's noted, I, well, the first person I, I can think of who said it in the European tradition was Dante in his um, quest for a, an appropriate literary language for Italian, which was not Latin. And he ended up choosing his own dialect, surprise, surprise. Um, Florentine, uh, Italian, but he also was aware that in some sense language was changing all the time. It's not clear that he knew that language was changing from one language to another, so that Italian is nothing more than modern Latin. Or, um, but nevertheless, he did think that there were um, parts of language which um, could never be pinned down because there, there's something indeterminate about vernacular language. He wasn't really happy with doing the language. So I mean, it, it went on. It, it, it was, it was, um, this uh, interplay um, has persisted down the centuries, really. Um, and even now, today, um, I remember when I was learning linguistics in the 1970s in the USA. Um, <coughs> I mean, I was in this strong Chomsky school, which tended to idealize what language was and meant to be dramatic or not. There were other schools, I think of them particularly associated with Georgetown in the USA, who were much, had a much more open statistical view of what constitutes any given language. And the idea was that you would be able, in some sense, to, to, to formalize those uh, statistical tendencies and, uh, and get a new way of, of, of documenting languages. So it's, that, that, um, that question of whether it is possible to make languages clear and cut and dry has continued throughout. And there will be different views um, you know, among you with your, with your, your colleagues theorizing whatever languages you're working with, I'm sure. Um, it, 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 Language or the study of language remains fuzzy around its edges. Does that make any, any sense at all? Or is it going to be a question? And I'm posing a question can the language teaching method that was used to teach, that's an industrial language or industrialized language, can they be used to revitalize 
language. How do you differentiate? Uh, would you be discussing this further in the next days? So to yeah. differentiate between what language teaching as a method from that of a dominant language like English to that of a uh, language that you are referring to as the Brazilian language or the master teachers one. That, do, are they different essentially, or, or do they actually work? That's also another question. And are they being different because from what I understand being an English learner in a very alienated context, it's, it's a very mechanical process. The language teaching methods that were devised for like languages like English are very mechanical. But uh, to reclaim a language, uh, does such mechanical methods work? Yeah, I don't think they do work terribly well, but you, you, some of them are um, fairly mechanical. Um, and others are, are, are less so. Um, what happened, uh, what I'm trying to say is that gradually people have changed their concept of what is a language which is worth documenting and worth learning, and which is widened and widened in, in the course of the last 500 years. It widened very little in the thousand years before that, although there was language teaching, but never people only thought it was worth doing it for the, for the classical languages. But then um, people have had different ideas as to what are good ways to teach languages, which they didn't have in those thousand years when they were teaching Latin and Greek. They had a particular method which was used and had been defined really in, 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 the, 13th, in the third century AD, and it continued certainly until the, the 15th century AD, um, effectively using the same books, not just using the same method. And they, they knew it worked and they kept on using it. And they had they didn't see the idea that the culture was changing and the language was changing. Everything has been more fluid since 1500. And it's been fluid in further on our our ideas about what is an effective method of teaching language, but it's fluid also in thinking which languages are worth teaching. Now whether they will ultimately be uh, good teaching languages or not, we don't know. There's a tendency to believe uh, that if somebody wants to learn a language, they will learn it, just and they used to learn it in the olden days, just as they learn it now. And it's basically human intelligence related to somebody's language. Language, as one of the things that Chomsky says, is, well, I wish I do agree with him, is that um, a human language is something which is intrinsically learnable. It has form in its state because that's the way that um, human minds organize it. And so you can expect whatever methods you use, unless you put people off by boring consensus, are going to work. But, um, but, they, but the reason that they will work is not probably because they are good methods, but because human beings are good language learners. If we do not have any questions, I think uh, we can surely close it today. And uh, thanks, uh, Nicholas. Thanks.